but I touch my face a lot, and so. Good evening. <laughs> Can you guys all hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for trekking through the Colorado weather to be here for my very last chair of the Dr. Cog. So. But it means a lot to me because you all came here just for this, and that means a lot. All the way from Castle Rock, you have Boulder. I know Boulder's on their way, so we're getting the, the spectrum here. We got Georgetown. Georgetown, oh, even more. <laughs> and Aurora's in the house, I know that. So Lock Bowie, Lock Bowie. all right. See, right on. All right, Bennett. <laughs> Thank you, Outskirts, for coming. D Denver, you know what? If Denver did not show up, I'd have a real problem, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're all staying at the Oxford Hotel afterwards, if we want to go ahead that on his credit card. Uh, but I will call to order the uh, Board of Directors for Dr. Cog on Wednesday, February 29th, or February 19th, and if you would all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Can I have a roll call, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> all right. Eva Henry, Steve Odoricio, Jeff Baker, Bill Holland, Elise Jones, Deb Gardner, William Lindstedt, Heidi Hinkle, Randy Wheelock, George Marlin, Nicholas Williams, Here. Kevin Flynn, Here. Roger Partridge, Laura Thomas, Ron Angles, Libby Zabo, <coughs> Bob Pfeiffer, Here. Mike Kaufman, Allison Coombs, Here. Larry Vidum, Here. David Spellman, Aaron Brock or Brockett, excuse me. Junie Joseph, Margo Ramsden, Adam Cushing, Here. Roger Hudson, Deborah Mulvey, Here. George Teal, yes. Tammy Bow or sorry, Tammy Mauer, Here. Jeremy Fay, Randy Wheel, Here. <clears throat> Gail Christie, Nicole Frank, Craig Hurst, Jackie Thomas, Catherine Whitman, you ready? <laughs> Steve Conklin. Here. Linda Olson. Here. Bill Gipp. Linda Montoya. Here. Drew Peterson. Bobby Sindelar. Lisa Jones. Laura Brown. Lynette Kelsey. Here. Rachel Binkley. Present. Jim Dale. Here. George Lance. Dave Curver. Mike Hillman. Stephanie Walton. Here. Dana Gutwein. Jacob LeBure. Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Pamela Grove, Larry Strock, present, Wynne Shaw, present, Joan Peck, Marsha Martin, Ashley Stolzman, Here. Connie Sullivan, Arnie Drysat, Joyce Palzuski, Paul Sutton, Here. Chris Larson, Julie Duran Mullica, John Dyack. Sally Daigle, Dave Black, Sandy Hammerly, Clint Folsom, Here. Jessica Sandgren, Here. Herb Atchison, Anita Seitz, Here. Bud Starker, Present. Adam Zarin, Rebecca White, Here. Bill Van Meter. <coughs> Mr. Chair, we have quorum. Thank you. I don't know, I'm, it looks like I'm gonna have mic problems tonight. So, um, thank you very much, so we have a quorum. Next up, if I can get a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, that moves forward. Um, next up, item number five, a community spotlight on the city of Glendale. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rachel Binkley. I'm a councilwoman in the city of Glendale. I know you've been all looking forward to this and you are in for a treat. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, brought the city manager, Linda Cassidy, wave for everybody. 
worked very hard on this. <laughs> she will be answering any really difficult questions. Um, so let's see if I can work this. Glendale. Okay, so we incorporated in 1952, and I'll let you read that, but it was contentious. Um, Denver didn't want us to do it, and in fact, where this was going in 1961, um, the state legislature created the Glendale Bill uh, so that they could re-annex us without our permission. So it kind of started off really contentious, went all the way to the Colorado Supreme Court, um, where they stopped it. So we're still Glendale, we're not Denver. Uh, and uh, it's really interesting, this has been used, they call it the Glendale Rule, uh, in several other state Supreme Court cases um, around the country. So uh, when we were digging into the history, I just thought that was really interesting, wanted to make sure that uh, we got that in there. And I, I think, this is an I think, and please look this up to get the correct information, uh, that this, by 1961, was affecting a couple other um, cities you guys probably know around uh, the metro area. So we're friends with, with Denver now. It's not, not that way anymore. Um, <laughs> I was going to tell somebody just to switch it, but I guess that's me. I'm that person. Okay. <laughs> uh, so here's some of the, our city manager actually pulled all these out. She thought these were funny. Uh, some of the headlines around that time, um, there were two huge fires that happened in Glendale that uh, Denver just refused to help us with. And in fact, the police wouldn't even let people cross like Colorado to help. Um, and I have written down the cities that did come over and help, which was, well, Lowry, I guess they were the Air Force Base then. Uh, Cunningham uh, and Littleton. So uh, thank you, those towns. <laughs> it, gets, it gets better. I said, we love Denver now. We love Denver now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if we have some pictures of Denver in here, too. We have, yeah, we actually have a, a pamphlet from the 70s where I believe it was, it termed itself the swinginest town, no, the swinginest square mile <laughs> in Colorado. So you can now refer to us that way. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so here's some, <laughs> some pictures of Glendale. Um, I'm not sure if anybody remembers this dairy here, but where this trailer park is, is now uh, that King Supers on Leedsdale. Uh, if you guys know, uh, the first King Supers, I think, of course, to have to sell liquor and have, have liquor there. Uh, probably the best one in that neighborhood. Sometimes I can't go there because it gets so busy, but it's just interesting to see how different it looks um, here from then. Yeah. Holy cow, for real. <laughs> Uh, as some iconic landmarks. Raise your hand if you remember Celebrity Sports Center. <laughs> uh, and the Cooper Movie Theater, I believe this is where our city manager saw, what was it? Star Wars waited in line, the first Star Wars. Uh, and I don't, do you remember where Bob's place was? Alameda in Colorado. Yeah. Uh, this is from that pamphlet, The Swinginest <laughs> Square Mile. <laughs> um, I think this is talking about the bull and bush here. But Glendale has everything over here. Um, just, a, I wish I had been old enough to enjoy this because it, it really does look like a fun place to be. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we had we had fun with this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, places we remember. Oh, okay, you guys. Do you, if I have just a second, I'm gonna read you something. Uh, so if you look here, we had the first McDonald's in Colorado, and uh, we dug up a letter that was sent to us from Ray Kroc. Saying somebody said it. Yeah, yeah. This is to certify the arrangements by which McDonald's system blah 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 is happening 
talking about Mr. Carl Reed, who must have been the, going to be the manager or the franchise owner. And then he goes on to say, about the only thing that could happen that would be beyond our control would be some unusual activities on Mr. Reed's part, such as gambling, chasing women, drunkenness, and things of that nature. We supervise and cooperate with all McDonald's licenses very closely, but in case such a thing developed, I want you to know that we would take over <laughs> and make arrangements for the sale to an acceptable party. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> Only in Glendale, yeah. And I think that there's still a McDonald's there just across the street from where that one was, yeah. Um, celebrity. Oh, is this the one that has, though, the fool's gold sandwich I was told to mention that was Elvis Presley's favorite sandwich that he would fly in and eat at the airport, I think, yeah. Again, please look that up, that's lore, so I'm not sure. Uh, so our transformation here, our population is 5,200 people. Um, I'm gonna ask you really quickly and uh, to make a bet, this is how many people live there, and I want you to think in your head, how many people actually work and come there during the day? So this is how many people sleep there at night, and I want you to be thinking about that, because I'll tell you that, that answer later on. Um, we're bigger than we were. We've annexed some Denver ourselves to make some parks. Uh, let's see what else is on. Oh, the number one target in the nation. So I'm sure if you use that target, you understand. Uh, it's busy all the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's just just in the sweet spot for people to come get their their goods. This, people, what you're looking at here is the only house that is in Denver, the only single living <laughs> house. It's right behind the Four Mile Park. Um, everything else are like condos and apartments and things like that. So we have one, one house. Although uh, the mayor before we, w we currently have swore up and down that the brew house of the Bull and Bush counted as a second house. <laughs> So this is, this is the one house that we have there. All right, so the number of people that we have that come in and work every day, did anybody get anything? Tell your friend to see if you're right really quick. Tell your partner. 25,000. So we have 5,000. You got it. <laughs> we have 5,000 that live there and 25,000 that work there every day. Um, and that's not including the people that work at the stores uh, or the people that come shop at the stores. Okay. Uh, Glendale today, beautiful. Look, our side of the street is beautiful. Who's on the side? Very well maintained. Um, so bike paths. <laughs> we have, we're in charge of uh, the bike path that goes by the four mile. Um, I'm not sure of the exact where it lets off and Denver takes over, but we're in charge of that and part, um, part of four mile. So beautiful. Uh, here's our police out in the community. This one down here is really funny. Uh, it's a Denver police officer and a Glendale police officer. The Glendale police officer is on the Glendale side of the road, and the Denver police officer is on the Denver side of the road. And I think <laughs> Cherry Street, do you know what the cross street is there? Uh, Cherry and Kentucky, yeah. <laughs> Um, and this is the, about our 180, which is going to be a river walk area uh, that we already have developers. I'll let you guys read uh, what's happening here. Something I don't think we put on there, though, is there is a website if you want to check it out, which is glendale180.com. Yep. Uh, so you can see what's going to be there. So it should be right across the street from the Target. So make sure I have all that all information there. Yeah, so that'll be... That will be fun. We've been working on this for quite a while since I was on the planning commission over 10 years ago. So it's been a little time in coming, but I'm really excited. Uh, we have uh, Infinity Park Events Center uh, where we host um, 
parties, proms, bar mitzvahs, a lot of charity events apparently in October for some reason. Uh, it's, it's always full up. Um, it's high tech and it hits kind of that sweet spot. Uh, it's not as big as the convention center, but a lot better than a lot of the like hotels for about 400 to 700 people. If you are interested in coming and you need an event center to host something at, uh, you can get all the information at infinityparkeventcenter.com. Feel free to look that up. And we are Rugby Town USA. Uh, so <laughs> we have the only dedicated um, rugby stadium in the United States. Uh, and we've just, uh, this is a picture of before. And this is actually part of what we annexed from Denver, all of this stuff here. And then <laughs> uh, this is, I don't know if that's over there, but the same picture, we turned it into a big park. And on the other side of the park is the stadium right near the fire department and the police station and the, and the city. Um, building. I don't know if y'all have been in Glendale, but it's all kind of in one little block, square block right there. Uh, we also host in the summer at our stadium, we also host uh, movie nights and beer festivals. Um, if you do need to rent out an event center, you can drink inside, you can drink outside. It's Glendale. <laughs> Uh, here's our rugby team. And for the past, so we started off, you know, if you're in Denver, you have the Barbos. Uh, if you're in a lot of cities, it's big in Colorado, you have rugby teams. Uh, so we started off, uh, you know, semi-professional team. And for the past three years, we've been a professional team. And I don't know if there's any other city managers here, but uh, Linda has been talking about having to deal with agents and like it's so strange and people from like all over the world. Uh, but we love our rugby team. They are part of the community. They, you can walk into our city building where our police station is, where our city employees are. There's always <laughs> rugby guys walking around asking if they can help out. Um, and it's a lot of fun. People from the community, I mean, it just gets packed during our games. Our season just started. I think our home opener is this Saturday. You're all welcome to come down. And we have, let's see if I can work this click on it. Uh, Denver, you'll see some of yourself in here. Oh, plus we're still waiting for some people, right? Just to recap. <laughs> Once again. This is Kelly. Please applaud for Linda, please. She spent a lot of Thanks. <laughs> Any questions for Glendale? Oh. <laughs> oh, Denver. Apparently, they have a better side of the sidewalk. <laughs> um, any questions? Nah, it's okay. It's all love in here. All right, seeing none, we'll keep on trucking so we can get out of here. Uh, reports from the chair. I just want to say, since my last meeting, uh, it's been a pleasure. It's a lot of work. I don't, you know, I don't want to discourage anyone ever to go on the executive committee, but. I think you know you build yourself up, you get up to the chair, and then they don't tell you that. Oh, by the way, you got to go to the Capitol. You got to go see the governor. You got to go see the you know the speaker of the house. Oh, by the way, there's a community upset, and you got to go visit them. And then all of a sudden, they got uh, 40 more hours thrown onto every month that you were not expecting. Uh, but you know what I appreciate. What I do want to say with this with this group is where we were and where we are today. What I really, really, really appreciate about this board is the diversity and the harmony and the neighbor neighborly feeling we have today than that we didn't have seven years ago, in my opinion. I also appreciate the diverse needs of every one of your communities because I've been to Georgetown to meet with your locals, uh, Neely, Miss Neely, all the time. I've been to Boulder County. I've represented Boulder County at the Region 4 TPR meetings. That's an experience. Right, that. <laughs> that's that's an experience I'll never forget, Elise. Um, <laughs> So I do, th you know, and then you, you have your own community needs at the same time as chair, but you got to put those aside to represent the better, the betterment and the better of all of us collectively as a unit and, and go by what we all agree as a collective board. Um, and, and it was an honor to do that for this last year. And I think our executive teams and the nominating committee that has put together the, the slates have done a fabulous job. 
we have some great chairs coming in. You know, next month will be Mr. Dyack from the town of Parker, and uh, he'll be taking the helm next month, and we'll continue doing the great work that Dr. Cog does. So, again, it was my privilege, my honor to serve all of you and your communities and representing our community, you know, our region, and we'll continue to do the good work that we all do collectively. So, thank you for giving me this this opportunity. So that being said, we'll move over to Performance and Engagement Committee. Thank you. Performance and Engagement Committee met earlier this month, and we have some very exciting things in store for everyone at the annual awards. So we talked about the Distinguished Service Awards and the John V. Christensen Award, and you will all be so excited to find it all out. You have to come to the awards ceremony. Um, so at your place this evening, you'll find a little um, bookmark about the Dr. Cog Award celebration. So put this in whatever you're reading, put it in your day planner, make sure it's on your calendar. You can get your phones out right now. Make sure it's on your calendar. But we really have some exciting things in store for you. The program will be shorter than it's in the past and, and peppier, and it's at a very exciting location. So we should have a good time. Hope to see everyone there. Is it in Glendale? <laughs> Actually, I was I was thinking since Glendale has such a nice um, event center, that would be a great thing we, for Glendale to do to host the Dr. Cog Awards for us um, next time. So we, that, that we sounded fun. We mentioned it uh, as we we're standing there. We mentioned that that could be a, another place. Yep. It, yeah. looked, it looked fun. Yeah, it does. It's not. It's at it's at Mile High Stadium. So that'll be really yeah. fun too. Yes. Uh, next up, uh, the report from the Finance and Budget Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we didn't uh, meet today. Okay. Uh, I used the time to go down and make Whoopi in Glendale. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's good to hear all the laughter because this board was not like that a long time ago. I think. <laughs> Um, I, for, forgive me for two things. I have two more comments before I give it over to, to Doug. One, I want to introduce new alternates. Uh, Chris Giordanelli from City of Brighton. Did I get that right? Okay. Uh, next, Mike uh, Sutherland from the City of Centennial. And Tim Barnes from the City of Lafayette. Um, and then I, I, bad for me to not say this, the staff here is un, they're the best staff we, we have and we're lucky as a board to have the engine behind what makes us successful and I, you know, I apologize for not bringing that into my conversation earlier, but the leadership of the staff and the staff themselves are so dedicated and respected. If you talk to any of your staff within your own communities, you'll see how much uh, respect that they have for the staff here at Dr. Cog and what they do for us every day. So I wanna thank the staff for all of your support of the board and helping us achieve our objectives and our Metro vision. So thank you. And now to Mr. Duck, Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me see, first item. So last month on the agenda, we had an item on there um, soliciting members interest in serving on either the Finance and Budget Committee and Performance and Engagement Committee. We asked for those solicitations, those statements of interest, or just call me or, or Melinda by the, by the end of this week, so Friday. I'm assuming those that are on P&E and F&B want to continue, so. Uh, but if there are any new board members that would like to participate on those, just please reach out. We've had a few, but please reach out to myself or Melinda and let us know. Um, award celebration, uh, Director Stolzman did a great job of summarizing that. I will tell you that there is, so for, for all of our board members, it's free admission in, into that event. Uh, it's, um, if you want to bring it a, um, a, a significant other, it's $49 which is a discounted rate, so we, we, uh, we would strongly encourage you to do that, as well as table sponsorships. Um, as you know, this, this, this uh, event is, is, um, is funded in part or almost exclusively with sponsorship dollars, so uh, please consider table sponsorships with regards to that. It's $900, and it gives you 10 seats, and uh, it's a great opportunity to, um, to uh, bring staff from, from, your, from your local community, so please consider that. I would like to give a shout out to the uh, board directors who uh, braved the elements. Uh, was it last Friday that Dr. Cog at the Capitol? We had a, f had a few out there. I know Director Williams, <coughs> Director Maurer, 
Um, Director Lindstad, Director Mulvey. Is there any other that I missed? Does, Show does it count that I tried? Yeah, I know, I know. The, the weather was horrible, if you guys remember. Um, but it actually, it yes, though. game was great. I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure it was. <laughs> But it, <laughs> it actually worked out pretty well because the, both the House and Senate were delayed until 10 o'clock start. So some of the uh, uh, representatives and senators that were, um, um, you know, came in early, they were just walking around, right, trying to find something to do. And we were there with bagels and burritos. So it kind of worked out pretty well. But it was, it was great, the opportunity to just talk about Dr. Hogg's mission, some of our programs with them, as well as we were uh, introduced on the House floor as well by former council councilwoman um, from Westminster, now Representative uh, uh, Shannon Bird. And so that was, that was kind of nice. We appreciated that as well. Um, earlier this week or last week, you should have all received a, a, a notice about funding through Dr. Cog to support the Urban Land Institute Technical Advisory Panel for in your jurisdiction. Um, these are multi-day exercises um, where, we, where they put ULI volunteers to work to help your community in our region address pressing land use and development issues. The application period is currently open and, and will close on Friday, uh, February 28th. So if you are interested in that, please feel free to contact either myself or Brad Calvert on our staff um, to learn a little bit more. But I think those that have, have the uh, opportunity to participate in those ULI uh, technical uh, panels, I think they would suggest to you that they're, they're very worthwhile. Um, let me see here, let me get through. Oh, here's something I wanna mention to you. In case you guys haven't heard, uh, Mayor Richard Champion, who is the direct, Dr. Cog Director from Columbine Valley, He's the newest state representative for District 38. Everybody know this? It's pretty cool. He gave me a call there the other day. Um, you may recall that was the seat that was vacated by um, Representative Susan, Susan Beckman when she took a um, took a um, a position in the Trump administration. So he was he's really excited about it. If uh, if you if you feel so inclined, please reach out to him. I know he'd love to hear you with your congratulatory thoughts. But uh, but he has since resigned his position as mayor, of course, and um, and his position on Dr. Cog's staff uh, board as well. Um, I also would like to take a couple minutes just to recognize a gentleman that's uh, that has been working at Dr. Cog for the last 13 years or so. Um, Mr. Greg McKinnon, Greg Wave. Greg McKinnon right there. You're going to hear a little bit from him a little bit later on. He was recently awarded the Colorado Wyoming ITE, which is the Institute of Traffic Engineers Section Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, he's for more than 20 years, see, Greg has been in the Colorado community where he's worked in both the public and private sectors. Um, he's worked tireless, tire, tirelessly through the state, county, municipal agencies to advance their transportation vision. He works with these agencies to strategically program new projects. They use the regional trans transportation operations and technology set aside, which you'll hear a little bit about tonight, to plan, design, and construct new facilities that safely enhance the mobility of the traveling public in the Denver region. Those that been here long enough know that I believe this program is the hidden jewel of Dr. Cog. It is the true collaboration of our communities, and um, I'm always I'm so very proud of, of the program. Greg, who grew up in Canada, like myself, uh, received a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a master's degree in transportation engineering from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. And by the way, there's not a chance in hell I ever would have gotten into Queen's University. Um, <laughs> But he's, uh, he's, a, he's a wonderful person, and we're so very fortunate to have him on staff. So Greg, thank you for everything you do for this region, and congratulations. <laughs> Last but not least, do you turn that off? <coughs> Last but not least, I would like just take a point of privilege here to thank Chair, Chairman Pfeiffer for all the work that he's done over the past years, as well as the years he's, uh, he's served on the Executive Committee as well. He will he has one more year on the Executive Committee as past, past chair, um, and it is true. Um, I do call him quite often and ask for, can you do me this little favor? I need you to be at the Capitol at blah, 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 or whatever. Um, so I really do appreciate all the work that you do on behalf of this agency. And um, what I got out of your remarks is that my number will be blocked once uh, you <laughs> Thank you, sir, very much. That's uh, my thank you. I, I do have a comment for Greg. I work with Greg both professionally in my day job, and 
he is a watchful eye on our partners and he makes sure that our interest as Dr. Cog is always taken care of and he, he holds the partner groups at a very high bar and uh, I appreciate seeing it in a different lens and I can just assure the board uh, he is of high caliber and again when I talk about the quality of the staff here at Dr. Cog he exemplifies the, uh, the level and the bar that all of them perform at so thank you Greg and congratulations. Uh, moving right along, let's go into public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests for, uh, from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete the public comment. The chair requests that there are no public comment on issues from which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Is there anyone here who would like to speak public comment? If you can come up and just give us your name. Good evening, my name is Peter Piccolo. I'm the executive director of Vice Colorado. Uh, you have in front of yourself, I think, a letter from me regarding the TDM set aside grant process. And I just wanna share with you two quick thoughts that I shared with the RTC yesterday. Um, the first is regarding the integrity of the grant approval process, specifically regarding $140,000. Um, I wanted to highlight this, not that a competing application that received the same points as Bicycle Colorado's application was awarded 140,000 or try to pull that money back for, for my team. We wanted to highlight it with the hope that the right people would look at the grant review process and assess whether they, um, they saw what we saw to ensure that the integrity of the process is maintained. And I was pleased that the RTC yesterday really leaned into that point and had what I thought was a robust conversation about the process. And that really was the point, one of the main points of the letter. And the second point um, was regarding uh, establishing a waiting list. And so um, I think there are three points that, that I wanna make on, on this. First is regarding urgency. So as many of you, probably all of you know, the, the challenges of our current car dependent transportation system um, has multiple negative side effects in our community. And if we can invest money today to have an impact, I think we should do that. And so the notion of setting aside or pushing money forward to the future um, really doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and I say that because from time to time, there are applications that are approved that for whatever reason do not get off the ground. <laughs> Funding is available. And it's my understanding that a process of establishing a wait list doesn't exist. And that money is often pushed forward to future grant processes. And this process, I believe, is two years out. So if we can put the money to work now, we should do it because um, urgency, the, the current situation requires us to act with urgency. Second, a precedent has more or less been set. 140,000 was originally recommended to push forward two years. That money was pulled back and again, awarded to a competing application that received the same score as ours. And then finally, Bicycle Colorado, 28, 28 years and we've been doing it really well. We're a, a trusted partner, a reliable uh, steward of these funds. We have a very compelling proposal that we know can make an impact. And if we can make an impact now, if funds become available this cycle, um, I, I want to encourage you to, to allocate that money. And so the RTC uh, voted to put Bicycle Colorado on a wait list such that if money becomes available, it's invested immediately. And we support that, that um, recommendation, that decision by the RTC. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Moving right along onto the consent agenda, item number nine on your agenda, uh, looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So I have a, and I have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you very much, that carries. Moving on to the action items for this evening. Uh, the election of officers, attachment D in your packet, the nominating committee, who has been made up, and I wanna recognize them and thank them for their service. Uh, I think they keep going, right, for, to the end of the year. Is that right, Elise? Yeah. yeah. The nominating committee. Herb Atchison is the immediate past chair. He was on the nominating committee, as well as Nicholas William from the City and County of Denver. From the PNE committee, it was George Teal. Uh, the FNB uh, nominee, nominee was Elise Jones. The board of director nominee was Jim Dell. And the chair nominee was 
Julia or Julie Mullica. Um, I believe Herb's not here, but Nicholas is. So are you going to speak for the nominating committee on the election of officers? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, the nominating committee met last month to review a slate of, slate of candidates. We had seven great applicants. Uh, this was ultimately, I think, a very difficult decision for everyone there. Um, all of the applicants were qualified. All were very, thought very highly of. Uh, but after robust discussion, the nominating committee came to the unanimous conclusion to recommend Director Conklin uh, to be the next board officer in the treasurer position. And of course, with Director Flynn moving up to secretary, Director Stolzman moving up to vice chair, and Director Dx serving as chair. That's my report. I manually have to control my mic, apparently. Um, is there an, a motion to support the slate as proposed by the nominating committee? Yes, for nominations. Uh, I guess I'm supposed to ask for nominations from the floor. Nominations from the floor? Do I need to do it three times? <laughs> Twice is fine. All right. <laughs> Seeing none, we'll close the nominations and move forward looking for a motion for the proposed slate. All right. Second. Uh, before then, any discussion? I will just make a comment that it's it's a it's a tough process, and I'm glad that people were put their names in, and I appreciate the nominating committee to go through their due diligence to continue our success that we we experienced today. So thank you for your service on that committee. So those all in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed. Abstentions. Thank you very much. That carries, and congratulations to Ms. Well, to the board, the new elect, excuse me, executive board, and Steve. And Steve, the newly incoming member. For those that don't know, what happens is usually if you don't screw up, you move up the chain. <laughs> I, I've tested those waters. Um, so, uh, but Steve, yeah, Steve, you're, congratulations and welcome. All right, next up is item, sorry, I got to get back into the swing of this. Uh, number 11, uh, discussion on the recommendation of projects to be funded through the transportation demand management set asides for the 2020-2023 TIP. Attachment in your packet, Mr. Erickson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, my name is Steve Erickson. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the Communications and Marketing Director here at Dr. Cog. And I'm here tonight to talk about funding recommend recommendations for the fiscal year 20. 2021 TDM services set aside. So just to give you an idea of uh, what these set aside funds are for, the purpose is to support marketing, outreach, and research projects that reduce single occupancy vehicle travel. So for those of you that are familiar with uh, the Way to Go program, which I oversee, these projects should be working in, in concert with that program. So we're trying to get people out of cars and, and taking transit and riding bikes and walking and uh, carpooling, van pooling, even working from home. The program goals of this uh, particular call are to reduce traffic congestion. You can point right to our MetroVision plan and look at uh, uh, some of the goals we have in terms of VMT reduction and SOV reduction. Uh, ultimately, we want to be improving air quality. And we're looking for opportunities to pilot new approaches to TDM, transportation demand management. So if we find something in these projects that works well in one area, the hope is we might be able to replicate that and, and have success either across the region or in other areas. We obviously support healthy and active choices. Um, biking and walking we know are better for us than, than driving our vehicles every day. And it's important for us to improve awareness and also access uh, to mobility options for people of all ages, incomes, and abilities. So the funding that was available for this particular call uh, includes a couple of components. Um, the TDM set aside for four years uh, includes $1.8 million. So this is a two-year call for projects, so half of that, or $900,000 plus an additional $236,000 in unallocated funds from 2019 uh, for a total of $1.136 million. The process was to establish a review panel 
uh, to look at applications and to score those applications on things like VMT reduction, uh, innovativeness, and even replicability, that idea that we can you know, take good ideas and, and implement them across the region. Separately, there was uh, a staff-driven uh, uh, part of the scoring that was all about data. So we looked if, uh, to see if uh, projects were in um, an environmental justice area or uh, an urban center or even uh, short trip opportunity zones. So there was some separate sort of data-driven scoring done by staff. And then the review panel met to discuss um, and rank and then come up with recommendations for uh, this funding. So just a little more information on the review panel. It included a couple of internal folks and five external um, folks. And the internal uh, people were um, uh, my way to go manager uh, who oversees that program, as well as uh, our bike and ped planner on Ron Pepsorf's team. The external panelists included folks from CDOT, Regional Air Quality Council, Colorado Department of Health and Environment, RTD, and Mile High Connects. My role in this process was primarily to organize, um, convene, and facilitate uh, this discussion and come up with the recommendations. In terms of the timing on this process, in September we hosted a, uh, a workshop here where we kind of gave people an idea of what to expect from this call and, and what the purpose and goals were. Shortly thereafter, we issued a call for a letter of intent from interested applicants, and that was really to define broad concepts and give us an opportunity to get back with those folks and, and let them know if there were things they, they could or should change perhaps to make something eligible or fit better with this particular program. Uh, in October, we actually issued that call for projects with a deadline of October 25th to get those applications in. And then we gave uh, the review panel and Dr. Cog uh, staff some time to score and convened several times in November, uh, again in December, and actually had our last meeting in January of this year. We actually received 13 applications. Uh, the total requested amount in federal funds was $1.972 million. Uh, I then took the panel's recommendations uh, to Transportation Advisory Committee uh, at the end of January. The review panel had suggested that we fully fund six projects, um, and that was unanimous. There was some discussion about uh, the balance of 141000 but the majority of the people on, on that review panel had suggested they would prefer those funds be moved forward into this next call. Roughly two years out, it's probably more like 18 months out at this point in time. At the January 27th TAC meeting, there was quite a bit of discussion about those remaining funds um, and the idea that we should put those funds uh, to good use uh, in the marketplace, uh, discussed a couple of projects that were just below the line, and that committee ultimately voted to fund one additional project in, in addition to what the review panel had suggested. Um, I think in large part because of the scalability of the project. There was a project with a request of 150000 We had $141,000 remaining. Um, there was also discussion about uh, geographic diversity um, and a few other things that I think pointed to that one particular project. So this, this slide shows uh, the six projects that were initially recommended by the review panel for full funding. And then a seventh project, that Commuting Solutions uh, Commute Downtown Superior TDM program that was uh, recommended uh, by Transportation Advisory Committee. So this is what I took to um, the Regional Transportation Committee yesterday for uh, discussion. At RTC yesterday, uh, they uh, unanimously agreed on those top six projects. They unanimously agreed to add that seventh project in. And then we talked about um, what Mr. Piccolo mentioned in, in his comments, uh, this idea of a waiting list. Historically, I think in these calls, we have not had a waiting list. We, we, we I know, do that often with the larger TIP uh, projects, um, but, but there wasn't really a precedent for that here. But RTC uh, amended a tax recommendation to uh, put this Bicycle friend or Bicycle Colorado uh, digital bicycle friendly driver course on a waiting list. So should funds become available, if a particular project does not get off the ground and those funds are available, um, we would then go to this uh, backup project. And so that's really it. There's those seven projects. 
And what's different on this than what was sent out in the packet, because I had to adjust this PowerPoint yesterday, is this and then uh, uh, an updated amendment here. But happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Erickson? Yes, uh, Director Walton. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering, um, the project that is on the waiting list, was that the next um, highest scored project? Yeah. Yes, and actually it was kind of interesting, and, and to uh, Mr. Piccolo's point, um, in terms of that raw scoring, um, this project and that commuting so solutions project actually had the exact same score. The discussion at TAC was, um, when it came time to talk about the remaining funds, I had um, uh, people that were advocating for that commuti commuting solutions project um, to use those remaining funds, but nobody really advocating for the Bicycle Colorado project, um, and, and more people actually uh, wanting to move those funds into the next call. But the, but the raw scores, which is really just part of it, you know, you sort of talk through it then and, <laughs> and rank were identical in terms of that, that scoring. I would just um, encourage the opportunity to the process and if there are, uh, you know, observations that are bringing to the table, that welcome the opportunity to improve our um, process. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I, I will make a comment. I, I appreciate the tax effort here because. When we talk about equity, and I, I look at Elise because she was in a deep conversation we had with Denver a long time ago on equity. When you have already uh, Bicycle Colorado already at two hundred thousand dollars, and you have another Bicycle Colorado get grant, and they're tied, I think it's only fair to spread the. You know, when you have a tie to spread to make it equitable and geographically diverse, and and that's what you did. It sounds like. <laughs> I think um, it's a good point, Director Pfeiffer. That was that was one of the things that was also brought up. I think at TAP. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that was a good. Maybe we just put that into our process that if there's already one applicant and, and a second applicant ties up, then you go to the person that hasn't had the chance yet. So in other words, not have two bites of the apple with one applicant, so that everyone has fair share to these grants. Okay. Yes, uh, Director Solzman, and then Director Flynn. Thank you. Uh, just um, adding on to Director Walton's comment, I think if we're looking at the program and trying to understand um, if, if there are opportunities to improve, I think it would also be worth looking at this TDM pool and just trying to understand if there is um, something different to be done with the CMAC funding, like we could do um, regionally something to reduce fare on the transit system or free fare or something like that, and if, if there's something regionally we could do collectively together that would be more beneficial than these little grants here and there. Hmm. That's well taken. Director Flynn. Thank you. Uh, Steve, what is the likelihood or what's your expectation about having remaining funds? Well, Will funds you know, become available? I, I hate to speculate, but you know, the in this particular call, as I as I illustrated, we had two hundred and thirty six thousand dollars that was moved forward. That was from a project from two years ago that did not get off the ground. So it, it does happen. Um, you know, we hope all the projects are successful, but there is, I certainly can't put a number on it, but there is some chance that there could be uh, funds that become available. What was the amount of the Bicycle Colorado? The initial funding request? The request, yeah. I believe it was 201000 I think. And again, um, uh, Mo from Bicycle Colorado was at the TAC meeting, meeting and also said that that would be scalable. So kind of depending on what comes back in, if something doesn't get off the ground, I think we'd have to look at that and, and make some hard decisions. Thank you. Yep. Yes, Director. I'm just looking at um, transportation solutions. What are the four businesses that they're going to start with? They, they haven't identified those yet, so they'll be four large businesses. I mean, typically in the way to go program with employer outreach, we're you know we're talking to employers of at least 250 and often 500 or a thousand. And I think for that project, uh, Stuart Anderson was really trying to find four really large employers, probably a thousand plus employees. What part of the state are we talking about? It would be in the Dr. Cog region, but I don't know that he had identified exactly where that would be. You know, he co kind of covers fun, Glendale, um, and you know, and part of, of Denver, but I think he is looking with the Way to Go partnership really region-wide. Um, we all work pretty 
cooperatively, uh, all of the TMAs and, and Dr. Khan's outreach staff. Yep. Thank you. Yes, Director Seitz. Um, just out of curiosity, um, some applicants, why did we decide to only put That was, um, again, that was the one that was like right below the line, okay. um, you know, and uh, again, so scored highly, had a lot of support from, um, you know, that review panel. So that really was the only one. There was a, there was a delineation between those next two projects and, and those that remained for sure. Okay, thank yeah. you. You bet. Any other comments or questions? Looking for a motion to accept the RTC's Recommended motion with wait list. Got a first, got a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? That carries. Thank you very much. Moving right along into item number 12, a discussion on the state legislative issues. The first subject we're going to talk about is bills on which uh, positions have previously been made or taken. It's attachment <laughs> F. Uh, Mr. Morrow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so on uh, the bills, the, the matrix that we have that uh, just is basically provides an update of the bills that the board acted upon uh, last month. And there's really no substantive uh, additions to that other than what's in your packet. Um, but if anybody has any specific questions, we can take a minute to answer those before we move on to the new bills. And if not, we'll move on to the new bills. So we'll give it a few minutes. It looks like some directors are glancing through. So let's just give it a few minutes, a minute or two, and then we'll I'll look to see if there's any questions or comments. like Jeopardy. You should be writing down your answer. <laughs> All right. Any okay. questions or comments? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move right along All on right. to the new bills. So I believe we have G. six new bills on the list for you tonight. And um, let me characterize this a little bit maybe uh, for in the interest of time. We have... Um, four bills with recommendations, uh, all for support, and then uh, two other bills, one with board direction and, and one that's already dead. So um, I thought I would point out uh, Senate Bill 22, the um, geriatric provider bill we're recommending support, and then the three housing bills on um, the last couple pages uh, of this attachment, um, House Bill 1141, House Bill 1196, and House Bill 1201, all recommending support. If there's no objection, we could take one motion on fall, all four of those bills uh, to approve the staff recommendation to support. But obviously, like with any kind of consent calendar, if there is an objection, we can just take the bills one at a time. So it's at your pleasure. But we can give you a minute we to look at them. We want to do them one at a time or all the supports together. <laughs> Sounds like it's all together. Okay. Not controversial. <laughs> all right. So I will look for a motion to support uh, staff's recommendation on Senate Bill 22. 1141. House, uh, uh, is it? 1141. 1141. House Bill 1141. House Bill 1196. And House Bill 1201. So moved. Do I have a second? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Yep. Two. Thank you very much. Moving right along. Okay, so that takes us actually to the two transportation bills in the list. The first one, Senate Bill 94, is already been postponed indefinitely, so we don't need to discuss that. So then that <laughs> takes us right away to the next bill, which is uh, the long-awaited House Bill 1151 on uh, expanding authority for regional transportation improvements. Um, I wanted to start by 
saying a few words about possible motions or positions that the board could consider. And then I think Doug's gonna kind of um, give intro on some of the issues and some of the conversations staff has had with bill sponsors and others. So obviously we have it listed as board direction requested because we know this is an important bill and has garnered a lot of uh, discussion uh, among the board and others. Um, we've, we've, and we've been able to do this in the past. We can, we can take a position of monitor the bill. We can take a position of support or oppose. We could also take a position of amending or support with amendments. So there's some options with, to keep in mind as you think about this bill and discuss it. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Doug if he's prepared. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir, very much. Um, so as you recall, earlier this month, we had a board work session uh, specifically to talk about and discuss this bill. Um, and during that, that discussion, you know, we, we had, um, well, we basically asked what concerns you had about the bill. Um, is there anything that, you know, direction from you guys that we could share back with the bill sponsor? Um, to see if there's, um, you know, any appropriate changes could be made. So there was a few things that, so we actually met with Representative Matt Gray yesterday afternoon, and, um, and, and we had a good conversation about the bill structure and all that kind of good stuff. So the few things that we did talk to him about that um, we got direction, we believe, from you guys was first on the opt-out clause, the, the, the necessity to have something that is a little cleaner than what's currently in there. I think you can interpret that there is an opt-out option in there now. It's, a it's very muddled, I, I will give you that. Um, and, um, and Representative Gray, was he was certainly wide open to that conversation. He said, yeah, I'd be happy to include that as an amendment. Um, he even suggested as much that he'd be interested in us drafting that language. Um, he said, to quote, he said, he's not ideologically rigid when it comes to uh, this piece of legislation. So, um, so I, we felt very good about that, that conversation. Um, I'm definitely, I'm not overstating that. I mean, no, that's I think, exactly I what he I think he, he said. even said something to the effect of um, he, he's interested in having the bill meet our needs or, or say what we want it to say. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so the other... The other thing we talked to him about was in the hold harmless section, which is towards the end of the bill. Um, it made reference to, um, uh, it, it made, makes reference in the language specifically to state funding, and we wanted to make a change to, to that, it, that it, um, it basically relates to state controlled funding, so federal and state monies, and he, he was wide open to that idea too, because that was, that was the, the original intent of that language anyway, so that was just a little bit of cleanup. Um, we also had a conversation about the supermajority language that, that's in, in the bill because it kind of just hangs out there. We have found reference back to the original RTA language that speaks to two-thirds majority. So if that's the supermajority that's referring to, um, we have found reference to that. And it's, it's not really related to any degree to anything that we'd have any concerns about. Um, Rich, unless you yeah, feel different Yeah, there's, there's two that. places in, in the bill <laughs> Uh, one regarding um, vote to include property into the um, into the boundaries, and then another one on the location of the transportation system. And those those are the two places where where for an RTA currently it requires uh, a two thirds vote. There's also a couple little cleanup spots too. And I where's Ron? Ron back there? Yeah that Ron is noticed in the bill as well with regards to there's places in which, you know, they inserted language related to the, the TPO concept in the bill, um, or, or yeah, TPO, right? TPO concept um, that they missed in a couple places. So that's just clean up language that, um, that, <coughs> that he, was, he was amenable to as well. So that's really it. I thought it was a great conversation. I mean, he, he heard our concerns. I, I, you know, we had a larger conversation then about, you know, any kind of, you know, grand bargain that might be out there on the transportation side, and I think it's yet to be determined. Of course, we're still pretty early in the session. Um, there's a few concepts that are out there being discussed, but um, nothing, nothing concrete right now. Yes, Director Tolson. Are there any errors in the packet that you'd like to tell us about? 
<laughs> well, thank you for Back pointing my that knowledge. out. I'll say this. Um, so, <laughs> 1151 under the language, it does make reference to uh, C CCI has taken a position of oppose, which is true. Um, CML has taken, so Rich can probably explain this better than me, but they provide uh, information every week, Rich. Rich, why don't you explain this to me? There are two. Director Stolzman and, and others. That's, that's in the board packet that way because the board packet w was finalized uh, a day after, uh, not not Tuesday, this last Tuesday, but the Tuesday before, where I attended the municipal league uh, municipal caucus, and I just handed actually the the uh, sheet for the house bills that they passed out and that sheet listed a position of neutral. Now, and so I've been also told since then that there was a miscommunication after that fact that got out uh, and gave people the impression that CML had an official organizational position of oppose. Uh, but I'm told that their board will be meeting <coughs> Friday and will be correcting that. So, but there was a policy committee meeting in which they did take a position at that meeting of opposed with amendments, right? Correct. And I meant to ask you this. I'm sorry. I know we're just having a dialogue here. I, I, Do you want us to all leave? <laughs> direct, but Director Solzman or anybody else who was at that CML meeting, I never did ask what those amendments were. <laughs> Um, it was it was predominantly around looking for opt out language so that no one's in. And then there was a question about being able to opt out after um, there is some kind of tax, so that if someone le like is in a situation like many of us feel that we're in with RTD, sorry, Bill, um, that they would have some way of getting out from under it. Well, that's that's an interesting take. Yeah, the second part of that I never considered. Um, so I mean, what's the purpose then? I mean, basically, we're doing something that somebody can or cannot or may not or may wish not or or give up whenever they want to stop. I mean, it just seems weird to have an opt-out like that at the end, but anyways. Yes, uh, Director Shaw. Thank you. I uh, There was a lot of discussion, um, and I felt like there was a there was a lot of misunderstanding about how they work, and that wasn't cleared up. Um, I do understand, as CML, representing all of the municipalities throughout the state, that that it might be appropriate for them to take a different position. But I, I felt like it was kind of a rush to oppose. And, and again, lots of things were being thrown forward that you know, well, you know, people should have the right to opt out. Well, people shouldn't necessarily. They would have the right to vote on whether or not the projects are acceptable, but that never came into the discussion. So if CML, and I think that was about the time I had to leave, if CML, um, you know, could benefit from at least the feedback of how the RTA works, that might be helpful. Um, and if they can go back through their executive board, that would be helpful also. I think they'd probably do better as a neutral as they proposed, as opposed to the pose that they got. Yeah, Director Mulvey from Castle Pines. I'm looking at my notes from that uh, policy committee meeting, and and an additional concern about amendments was parity as to district funds and um, some way to solidify that um, or incorporate that in the process. And I agree with Director Shaw. There was a fair amount of discussion. I've got read all over my notes here on the different issues, but as far as the vote, it was opposed unless there's amendment on, as Director Seitz said, the opt-in opt-out, and then also as to parity and staff was uh, given discretion. And then, of course, that'll go to the board. That's what my notes reflect. 
before I go to the next person, can I comment real quick on that? I mean, parity would be a tough one because each MPO is handled it differently. You know, we do subregions and we have a percentage that goes down and, you know, like I was talking to North Front Range, uh, they handle it differently than, than we do. And I think it's hard for CML to say, you've got to have parity and then tell the MPOs how to do their money. I, I would tend to agree with you in a, um, my personal opinion. I just reflect what the issues were as far as the amendments and yeah. the uh, parameters of staff discretion. Discussion. Director Jones. I had two uh, questions. One is I recall the discussion we had about a supermajority here was around the vote to actually ad adopt the resolution to, be co to have an RTA authority. What you said didn't really track with whether or not they're saying that the bill as drafted would provide that supermajority vote on the RTA resolution, so I'd like some clarity on that. And then also, um, this, this uh, bill has been characterized as a necessary leverage um, to bring people to the table on some larger grand bargain, and I'm curious if um, Representative Gray uh, felt like it was still potentially playing that role or not. Well, I'll take the first one last, uh, or last one first. Um, <laughs> with, re with regards, to, yeah, right. <laughs> I'll get there sooner or later, that circle. Um, yes, I mean, I think he's always been quite open about, you know, what he believed this piece of legislation was. It was really a backstop, right, for, for some grand, larger statewide um, initiative. Um, but, he, but he did say he's, you know, I, as far as his optimism for that, Big statewide solution. I think it's. I, mean, I think it's waning, uh, at least in his mind. And he is serious about this piece of legislation. I mean, he wouldn't. He wouldn't have given it a hearing date. He wouldn't have calendared it if he didn't. Um, so yeah, it's, that's that's really where where he is with that. Um, on what was the second? What's the first part? Supermajority. Yes. So we did have a conversation a little bit about a supermajority and kind of the relevance of the supermajority because if it, if there was an opt out provision in the language, then it would only, we did have a conversation about governance. I don't want to go, I know it just might get down a rabbit hole real quick, but we did have a conversation about governance. So would it be the entire Dr. Cog board that would actually vote on a potential ballot initiative for a subset of the board, or would it be the governance would be kind of a, the subset of the board, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, in council meetings, you might go to your public works and something committee, right? And you, I know it's not the same because it's the same full council. But you know what I mean? It might be something like that. Um, so there was that conversation. But And if it was ultimately, you know, as a coalition of those that wanted to participate in the initiative, it just, it seemed odd that you would have a provision that would also have the supermajority because it would only, because you always had the option to opt out if you didn't want to participate, if you didn't like the terms. Um, now that doesn't mean, you know, we couldn't specifically ask. Ed, Jen, how am I doing on that? That's about what we talked about? Yes, it depends on when you say the opt-out. Yeah, right, yeah. And, and I could see the opt-out be like, you know, Commerce City has their own tax. There's no reason for them to jump in on this and be involved. And that should be an easy decision before, but. I don't know. Like you said, I guess it depends when the opt out and who opt outs, and maybe even why. I would think. Well, just to follow that, you might opt out because you have already raised your Tax. funds locally. You might opt out because the funds are being spent on something that is counter to exactly. what you think they should be spent on. So, depending, I mean, if you can't opt, if, if you have to opt out before the vote, or if you can opt out after the vote, I think. It makes that decision. Yeah, it makes sense. That adds more clarity. Uh, but to that point, um, if you can opt out after by when your council votes to put the matter on the ballot, or when somebody when it goes to, when there's a vote to put it on the ballot, it's not the council. It's yeah, the board. Board. Yeah. So that's the vote. Yeah, that's the vote at which you would want to be. It's sort of a double opt out option? Yeah, I mean, I, the resolution opting out on the actual vote to put it on the ballot. 
It's a great point. I, I understand the concern I for sure. I, I, and that's something we'd be willing to take to them and have further conversations with. I'm looking at Ron, but I can't really see him. But I think that's, right oh, there he is. He keeps so getting closer. I, yeah, right. So I think that's something that we can have further conversations. So I, I do get your point. And, and just one follow-up to the question you just asked. Some of the questions that, and the issues that are being raised here could be defined if the bill passes by Dr. Cog, True. if Dr. Cog wants to use it. So you might not want to consider all of these points as possible amendments, because you could leave your options open as to the specifics of, of an opt-out, um, the specifics of voting, other than framing it statewide in this bill. Just saying that we, what, but that doesn't make, I mean, it makes sense to me a little bit. But I mean, if we were to, to say we want, uh, let, let the MPOs themselves decide how the opt-out process should be adopted. You'd, you'd, want an, you'd want the bill to say that there shall be an opt-out process. Identified then, by the MPO. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yes, Director Jones. I'm, okay. I guess I just, if you don't necessarily know if you're going to control the vote at the MPO table that allows you to opt out, that is not exactly how you'd want to set it up, right? That's, yeah, if I may, I mean, I think that all the time on bills, it's a balancing act. There's always kind of a conversation folks have about how specific to be in a statute or how general, how much to leave to rulemaking or other, you know, other sorts of processes. And so it's always, and, and well, sometimes it's a difficult conversation, how much detail you want in the statute. So I, I don't think we're saying don't do that. Uh, just think about it and be careful about it. We also, I think it's worth pointing out in this discussion that uh, Representative Gray has given us specific permission to talk to the drafter directly and offer language and have amendments drafted up. So I'm not suggesting that we get into a drafting session right now, um, but we do have um, some uh, real opportunity here to, to get language that we want in the bill. Okay, Director Sandgren. So I think just sitting here listening to this conversation, I also serve on CML Executive Board. So I've heard both sides of this argument, and I still to this day could not clearly articulate what we're actually asking for. And so to go back to our council and then try to articulate that to them, we haven't taken a position on this because we've heard between this group, between the CML group, between the Metro Mayor's group, there's so many different things swirling around out there about the taxing, about the opting out. It would be helpful to have maybe a Dr. Cog fact sheet that just showed what exactly we're asking for and how that would work because the parts are moving so quickly. Last week was policy committee meeting. Tonight we're meeting here. Friday we're meeting with CML. And then of course down at the legislature, things are moving quickly. So I think it's hard to keep up with all the changes to even know what amendments might be happening or not happening. And I don't, I don't even know how to go back to CML, even from this conversation, to change the position that they've taken based on the policy committee. So I guess something straightforward, a fact sheet, something would be helpful. Okay, they'll get one to put together. Yeah, definitely, we can do that for sure. I have Director Stolzman and then Director Williams, so Director Stolzman. Thank you. Uh, so I've been pretty vocal about this bill. So I care very deeply about transportation and transportation funding, and I think that there are major transit problems and transportation problems in our state. Um, another issue that CML took, took up was that this does, basically this puts the nail in the coffin on any future statewide solution to transportation funding. Some people already feel like that's happened, and that's why they're saying that, you know, you know the coffin's already in the ground. What are you talking about? Um, but th this act, this, basically does away with any kind of statewide solution. And so that's a real problem as well. Uh, I look at this as bad legislation in general. Um, we, we constantly complain to one another, again, sorry, Bill, um, <laughs> about some of, the, some of the frustrations with the way that the governance is, uh, uh, has been structured over time at RTD. Um, some of it's through legislation over time that was rushed and probably drafted much like how we're doing here, just randomly throwing out ideas and going and talking to the drafter. Um, 
a lot of times I hear people say that 15 member board is too many people. It's really hard to get clear direction from the 15 member board. So we're, we're talking about <coughs> proposing a government that covers about the same area, except instead of 15 members, we want all of us to run the tax and we all wanna run the project list. And we think that that will somehow be an effective way to govern the funds. I just don't buy into it. Um, there's not an opt out today in there and so your area could be taxed and it could go to fund something that you have absolutely no interest in funding in a totally different part of the region um, or maybe you're the lucky winner that is able to take all of the money and use it in your area so there there are no guardrails here and there are no protections and i continue to ask the folks that are advocating for it what are we advocating for and they just continue to say this is just a tool in the tool belt so i brought my toolbox <coughs> here she goes <laughs> So when I worked, I, I used to work at a factory in Juarez, Mexico, and a, a lot of times, it's true, a lot of times people would come hey, into uh, the factory like floor the with a crescent wrench like this, an adjustable crescent wrench, and any of the maintenance guys would come over to you and grab it out of your hand and throw it in the garbage, because this tool will strip away the edges of what you're working on, and it'll wear it down over time. You, you'd never see somebody in a pit crew using this. You'll ruin your equipment. So this is a garbage tool. So that, you know, you have that tool, it's fine. Oh. So, so one thing that happens, Libby, I'm please. I'm <laughs> one thing that I brought up is that we haven't identified the problem. So you have a problem in front of you. And if you just arbitrarily start taking tools out of the toolbox, you might just get a useless tool. So we might be just working on a useless tool. We might get a tool out of it, and then somebody might decide to start using it wrong. We might make a tool, and somebody might start using it correctly. All of those things are tools in the toolbox that are totally ineffectively used. But what if we defined the problem, and we actually took the time to talk about it, and we found the correct tool? Wait, I'm Hold pretty on. sure we can't do that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> if you actually take the time to define the problem and come up with a solution, it could be really wonderful for everyone. Blow it out. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Oh, uh, open the door. Oh, open the door. <laughs> open the door. <laughs> we'll be ending our meeting early. Yes, disperse that smoke. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. So just, just randomly making tools isn't going to help us solve the problem. We all need to get together and understand what are we trying to solve. Are we trying to get to state funding for state highways? Are we trying to fund, fund local road maintenance? Are we trying to fund transit solutions? Once we identify the problem together, we can start working on solutions. But to just randomly come up with solutions will not get us a good outcome. So I would encourage the board to take a position of a post. <laughs> you know, I said something earlier about what we used to act like, and now I didn't know I did my last meeting with hammers and beating things down. I, um, I don't even know what to say. Uh, where are we? What are we doing? <laughs> Director Williams. <laughs> Tough act to follow. Um, uh, yeah, you might want to keep I, I that away from I just had one question. Feet. I'd read in the Colorado Sun that Governor Polis had made some statements about this. In the article, it seemed kind of generally opposition, but I don't know if anybody could provide any more context on no. that, if they're aware. Okay. Yes, Director. At the CML legislative... Um, Last Thursday, he did, as well as um, Speaker of the House and the Majority Leader, none of the three were firmly behind it. It's the way I would characterize it. Yeah, Director. Um, just from a, a purely uh, strategy perspective, um, if we were to oppose this bill, um, I guess my question would be, how does that impact its ability to be used as leverage for another solution? Because I feel that um, might totally undercut that, that, that leverage that we want to see. Uh, who's going to answer that? Or are we just moving right along? Director Dale. 
I think we're damned no matter what we do. <laughs> if, if you, we can't pass 110, we pass 110 in, the M, in our MPO, but so we say, hey, this could be a solution, but as soon as we bring it here, it's not a solution. And maybe in Jeffco, we agreed when we had sub-regional stuff, but maybe if we got the money in Jeffco and Golden didn't like it, we wouldn't vote for it. And if I didn't like it in Ward 3, I wouldn't vote for Ward 4 getting the road. And so <coughs> I, I guess the only solution is we could get the feds to give us some money. Uh, so if, we might as well go deeper in debt and get infrastructure bills. So if you have a great influence, where, you know, if you get 27 votes that we don't have in, in Colorado or 100, 300, or get 52 in the Senate or something, or get Mitch McConnell. I don't know any solutions. It just frustrates the heck out of me, and I've only been on this director for two years, but I see, uh, I don't see any money coming for stuff. Uh, Mr. Zabo could talk all about how much money we have at Jeffco. It's just, um, the picture is wonderful and rosy. Thank you. Uh, director Teal, then I have uh, Director Zabo. So I actually think that uh, Director Lindstead was on to something in terms of how to tactically handle this with our uh, endorsement to support, remain neutral or oppose. Um, it looks, it sounds to me like we do have <coughs> more interest in, if there is interest in participating, uh, unlike Mayor Stoltzman's uh, wonderful demonstration there, um, if there is interest in, in, in moving forward with this and getting to a point where we do want to support, we're not there right now. And so I think Director Lindstedt actually hit on a really good idea of let's oppose this, make sure we do have that access to uh, continue to amend and um, move forward in that. Did I get your name wrong, dude? No. You got it. Okay. What's the name? He's new, but come on. The but idea is wrong. Well, no, the idea, well, here's... Say it, say it. Well, that's what, say it, that's what I was going to ask. Is Director Lynn said, do you want to comment back? Or? I mean, I, I would just say that um, our position with this bill is to use, you know, maybe to use this tool if it, it turns out to be the right tool, but maybe this bill is the leverage we need for that statewide solution. I know people are really pessimistic, but if we just come out and oppose it and shut it down, I don't think that will be uh, a particularly strong... Um, incentive to make that statewide solution happen. Um, I think maybe it sounds like to me on this board, people aren't ready to support it. Maybe some people are ready to oppose it. But um, at this point, I think maybe we'd be strongest just to monitor it and try to make the changes we want to see and see if it creates that discussion <laughs> for a more long-term statewide solution. Well, if, if I may continue. Yes, uh, Director Teal. Well, with that said, I mean, uh, with your statement in, in place, well, great, then maybe we do just monitor it. I would, I would really hesitate at this stage of the game to, um, to make a motion to support it, though, because w w there are still so many uncertainties. It's just not the time to throw a support onto it. I disagree. I think a motion to oppose coming out of here will actually probably give us better bargaining power. However, I, I do see the wisdom in po possibly just monitoring. Director Zabo. Um, yeah, Ed, um, what, have you been talking to legislators about this? And what's been the sentiment? Is this thing gonna die? And we're talking about this for an hour and it's gonna die? This, this bill came up in the Summer Transportation Legislation Review Committee. Um, it's been introduced, but there hasn't been a lot of discussion about it yet. <laughs> so I can't say that. So you guys have not gone and no. uh, pulled the legislature? Not yet. It's scheduled for hearing on uh, first week in March, so two weeks. And there still are compromises and negotiations taking place on a statewide solution. Um, depending on who you ask, is that realistic? Yeah, probably not. But. Okay. Um, I think, Rich, did you want to say something now? Uh, I was just going to add that um, I think one of the things Representative Gray said in the meeting when he was talking about Absolutely. being personally pessimistic that there was going to be some grand bargain during this session, 
um, he made a statement where he thought that this could be the only bill left standing as we get closer to the end of the session. And he was still interested in doing something that would please us. <laughs> um, so I think we ought to uh, at least consider that option and try to stay at the table. I do fear, and maybe others have other experiences, I do fear that if you just take a position of oppose, uh, you're kind of out of the game. And um, I think the bill has a broad title, number one, and um, the spot you have a, a responsive sponsor, and uh, maybe we ought to take advantage of that. If we don't like what's in the bill now, we can suggest different provisions that we would like to see. So that's just one comment. Okay, uh, just one second. I got a, quite a few people in line here. I'm gonna go back to Director Till, and then I have Flynn, Dyack, Olson, Jones, Winshaw, uh, Director Wheel, and then myself. So, okay. Director, who else? Did I say? Yeah, Olson. Director Till, real quick. Uh, well, a, a simple question. Uh, obviously, it's great that we're being um, requested to input on this, but where are the other MPOs on this? Yeah. I mean, we're not the only one. I have not seen any official positions uh, on, on from the other MPOs. I think, um, was it the Pueblo one had expressed some support or at least some, some positive interest in looking at it as something that they could potentially use down there. I don't know if that's an official position, but I think Ed and Jen heard that from, from the Pueblo MPO down there. But same question I had, but to answer also, I met with the chair of North Front Range MPO and the chair opposes it. So I don't know if that's the board's position, but it's pretty vocal against it. So, and of course, Colorado Springs already has an RTA. So, yeah. So next up, um, Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like actually to make a motion so that we have something on the table. Okay. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we take a position that we will monitor this bill. Okay. I think it's clear to me from the discussion that that's the only, uh, if we take any position at all, that's the only one that would have a chance to have a majority support. So I'd just like to make so that motion. So we have a second. Um, do we have further discussion with those in mind on the motion? <coughs> Director Jones? Um, I would support that. I think I would like to hear more about how this body could be helpful in promoting a statewide solution. And I do think Williams right that keeping this bill alive or at least a bit longer is probably helpful to making sure that we're at the table and that people, we still have people's attention to talk about a statewide solution. So I would like us to actually have a stronger position on that. I would like to say for the record that if this bill were to pass, I would like an additional um, amendment, which is that um, any of the funding that flows uh, under this mechanism would need to be used in ways that, that uh, conform with the state directive under House Bill 1261 for our climate targets, because where we're going with transportation is <coughs> potentially in conflict with that. And <coughs> But more importantly, I support a statewide solution. And, and uh, we always have the opportunity to reconvene at this table and oppose the bill later if need be. But I think for now, monitor is probably the best position. So I'm going to just make sure everyone in line, if there's any changing comments, if you want to take any additional comments. So Director Dyack, do you have anything? You'd like to yeah, um, I think I'm about to play the role of Herb right now. Oh goodness! And I apologize for that, everybody. Because uh, anybody have a cowboy hat I can I can borrow? Uh, yeah, Mr. Jim. Dow. No, I don't. Think so. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I've I received a few phone calls about this, and uh, from from a, a couple of at least a couple of mayors, and uh, they indicated that uh, they would need a um, you know a a motion to support for it not to be in peril, at least in their eyes. So to me, um, monitor seems very appropriate, but based on their words, um, it might just make sense to not even render any type of monitor support or whatever, just sort of gather more information and kick the can down the road to maybe next meeting so we could get more information, more clarity, hopefully, so we can 
um, hopefully get some of these questions answered because it seems very theoretical right now. And um, we're talking theoretics. Um, I think we need more concrete before we start monitoring, supporting, or opposing. And I, I just, to me, from a leverage standpoint, it, it makes all the sense if, if people are close to it and they say they need, they need a, a, a support uh, and we can't give it to them, maybe it might make sense just to not take a position. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Uh, Director Olson. Oh. Yeah, okay. is that, it's on finally. Um, hearing that statement, I, I agree to some extent, but I think I'm very concerned that we're not gonna be seen as wanting to be at the table. And that's my biggest thing tonight. If we're not all in favor of this in some way, I would, I and I am to some extent, I do think there's some strangeness in this and that, that might work against us in the long run as was suggested by the little demo we got. Um, although I don't, there's some flaws in that demos, but I won't do that to you tonight. <laughs> but I, I am really nervous that we are not gonna do something that pushes each other to do something together. And if this is the one thing right now at this time, then I wanna see us say, at least let's monitor it and tell people we're actively monitoring it. Let's produce some papers on it. Let's produce the data that's been asked for. Let's get some more information out there on pros and cons. What, what is all this? And let's present it to the legislators too to say this is what we're seeing both here and there. And I know some of that's already been produced. So maybe we just need to endorse some of it more clearly. But I would like to say we're actively at the table and not close any doors. So I appreciate what, what he said earlier. Director Winshaw. Thank you. Uh, I would speak in favor of a support if amended, um, because I think that does keep us at the table. I believe that it allows us to get the changes that are important to this body to be written and presented, um, I fear that uh, that looking, even looking disinterested, monitoring is, you know, looking disinterested, that we're not going to have a seat at the table. And, um, and to Director Stoltzman's point about uh, having the right tool at the right time this particular tool is not going to be something we could create, you know, in six months or 12 months potentially. And so it's almost a matter of striking while the iron is hot. And we have the option of not using it if it is the wrong tool. That's my thought. Uh, <laughs> Director Wheel. Thanks. Um, we chatted about this at our city council meeting. I think the consensus was basically that. Okay, first of all, transportation is a problem. Our arteries are more and more clogged with every succeeding year. Um, we didn't take it in the spirit of, you know, kind of <clears throat> playing games, develop leverage. We looked at it as. A statewide solution could have happened, hasn't happened, doesn't necessarily appear like it will happen. So as a better than nothing a opportunity, this looked pretty good. And Dr. Cog looked like the right place to, to have this uh, authority vested. So I, I think, and, and we're smack in the middle of a bunch of other municipalities. So, you know, nobody's an island. We're interdependent. And, and if we can't do it at a state level, then doing it in a regional level is the next best alternative. So I, I think our group was very supportive of, you know, I can't argue about uh, wrong tool. I think we have <laughs> flexibility and opportunities to say, okay, let us define what the right tool is. We ought to take that opportunity and then come up with something uh, that we can support. Thank you. Yeah, Director Vim. Um, so after uh, contemplating uh, many uh, points of view, I think Director Dyack uh, spoke the greatest wisdom. I think to uh, not respond provides us with the greatest ability to uh, influence future developments. 
so I support his point of view. So uh, that's Director LeBru. Thank you, good try. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Correct me, please. Uh, you're fine, LeBru. Um, LeBru. Nobody can get, my mayor can't get it right after two years, so. Um, <laughs> sorry, Adam. Um, <laughs> I'm well, sure I was just going to say this uh, bill too. So yeah, I just want to say I think um, you know I think we've tried the statewide solution for the last two years, and I don't see immediate. Well, two years. I say that, but yeah, I was going to say well, just two years immediately. <laughs> I think 15 years ago I was working with referendum C, knocking doors, talking about that discussion as well, but. I guess my point is, I think this is a, a new opportunity, um, a new potential method of us to have additional tools, as we keep saying, um, to be able to fund projects that we know people in our community want, they want to see, but they haven't had the, we haven't had the support of the voters statewide to be able to implement. So I think we should be keeping the door open as much as we can um, to see something move forward. And I don't, I, I think that either looks like what Mr. Dyack said about continuing to collect information and keeping the door open to possibilities or um, really looking at some sort of way to get on a support path. So I think one of those two ways is the way we should be looking at. Thank you, Director Stolzman. Thank you, I, I appreciate the robust debate. Um, I haven't changed my opinion, but um, I, I just would encourage every single person who suggested that we su should support this and needs this tool that we have the existing capability of creating RTAs together if we want to work together to create a tax. And while that process is not simple, it has a lot of necessary steps that ensure that we have agreement with one another on things like the tax rate and how the tax will be collected and allocated. And so you have to go through the work and the effort of understanding what you're going to spend the money on. And I would encourage every single person who has said, we need money and we need a regional solution to start working together on making an RTA. I believe we have the tools available to us. And if that is <coughs> what folks wanna do, we should do that and, and start working with your neighboring communities or even farther out. Um, I'm very open to working with my neighboring communities. We've been very supportive of our county in, in coming forward with a countywide tax, um, trying to support like a list of projects and working together on things. So I, I think there are other tools available. I'm, I'm, I understand the need to fund transportation and I understand the desire to do things regionally. I just believe we have tools at available to us today. And the reason people don't want to use them is because they don't want to have the hard conversation about what are we going to fund and how is this going to be governed. And the reason they don't want to have that conversation is because we don't agree. And it would be almost impossible to get every single person in this room to agree on a project list. And it would be almost impossible to get everyone in this room to agree on the share between transit and highway or highway and local or county and city but it wouldn't be impossible and that conversation is necessary and needs to happen and that's why i believe we should use the rta tools that we have available to us because it provides the attack protections that we're all looking for it forces the conversations that have to happen and we could go forward and do that today i think creating this is just a way to try to not have those conversations trick people into doing this and then hoping that a future board can figure out how to use the money and i think that that's a recipe for a disaster um, i'm i understand the idea to try to leverage this for something else i just don't believe that's going to happen and i think what's going to happen is like okay well this is still on the table let's pass it and i think that's a bad idea so that's why i think we should take a position of oppose. I don't think there's anything to leverage this against. I don't think there's any conversation to be had. So I think we should just make it clear that this is directionally incorrect. I guess if, if we do take a position of support, I would volunteer to work with the drafters and try to write something that is perhaps useful because this is in no way useful in my opinion. Uh, Director Zabo. Zabo. Don't throw anything, please. She I broke it. <laughs> she, I can probably talk loud enough so you can hear me anyway. Um, she hid her toolbox for me or her tool bag. Um, are we letting the good, the great get in the way of the good? Right? Um, the great would be a, a statewide solution. 
You know, when I was down in the state legislature, the first year I was in, people asked me, what was the biggest thing you were surprised by? And it, I told them it was that <laughs> there's no dollars coming out of the general fund for the core function of transportation. I said that shocked me. So there's two ways to do this, and we've tried both, right? Either the state government has to buck up and get some money out of that general fund and put it towards transportation, or they have to figure out a way how to go to a vote of the people and win over the people, because they certainly have not figured that out. And um, like uh, Councilman LaBeer, right? Oh, and I remember it, is it right? <laughs> right, you know how I remember it, guys? This is easy, like beer, yeah, you know, beer. beer. That's what I remember, beer. I don't know if he drinks beer, but, um, you know, like he said, we've, we've got to, the last two years, we've been doing, trying to do this for years and years and years. And um, I, I think that, we need to solve our own problems. If they're not going to, we need to have a way to do it, to solve our own problems, whether we use it or not. There's a lot of laws out there that no one ever uses. I think there's one like tie your, you can't tie your horse to the so many feet from a store or something. No one's using that anymore. Guess unless you have a Mustang car. Um, <laughs> but But I mean, just because we put the tool in the tool bag doesn't mean we, we use it or we use it often. So let's not let the uh, good get in the way of the great. S sorry, Ashley. Okay, uh, let's do Director Seitz and I'll come to Director Sandgren. Um, so thank you everyone. I, I feel a little bit like an uh, intruder in this conversation because I have not had 15 years of frustration of a, a statewide solution. Um, but with that said, um, I think there is some wisdom to wanting to force um, uh, reluctant stakeholders to a table. And so I am a little bit concerned at this point, if we choose to oppose or to not comment on it, um, do we lose that negotiating leverage, um, which I think is, I think ultimately Colorado needs a statewide solution, and I guess I'm not prepared to foreclose on that conversation yet. Um, and I think that, um, Director Stolzman, I think you may be correct that that's not going to happen, um, but I would, I don't, we can change from monitor to oppose if it, if it appears, but I definitely don't think it happens if we oppose this now. So I, I would like to see if we can have um, that grand bargain, and, and maybe I'm too Pollyanna-ish on this because of my uh, inexperience with trying to <laughs> find a, a statewide solution, um, but as somebody who believes that the success of my municipality and of the region is on a, a strong and healthy state. I just am not prepared to foreclose on that yet. Director Sandgren. So I guess my only question with um, whoever made the idea to support with amendments, who was that? So what would the amendments be? I guess that's the point where I'm still not clear. What are we asking for? So what we would want to see is the ability, the wording that makes a clear opt-out provision and uh, the, that it is, uh, it involves all of the money over which CDOT has control, which would include both state and federal funds. And, and point of clarification, we have a motion on the table for monitor, so let's not confuse um, the motion. Cor correct. Uh, let's stay but, focused on the motion. But she asked what the provisions were for support, for support with amendments. That's from what the, are those and amendments? Clarification is from the CML Policy Committee discussion. Is that where you're? Talking well, no. About? I just a few minutes ago, I I you? expressed my opinion that okay. we should support with amendments. I'm almost feeling like we should bring that back into the motion because we're losing where the motion is. Uh, um, I know I have uh, well. It would be a substitute or a friendly. What I mean, we let's pull it back. Let's go, let's talk about the first motion. The motion on the table is monitor. So okay. you're. I actually made that motion because we only we were just traditionally have the three options. 
uh, support, oppose, or monitor. <laughs> but in, a, in my mind, I suggested monitor so that we could continue to work. I don't know how we would implement uh, you know, support with amendments without knowing what the amendments actually are, what the body agrees the on. So that's, that's why I suggested monitor, but not to foreclose uh, the, 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 uh, the, the idea that we want to still be at the table. So not to add more confusion, can I offer something to the board? What I would recommend hearing the conversation would be, as a board, we should say we're seeking more information about where this bill's going, and we would like that to come back. Knowing our staff has heard the conversation we've had, we're seeking more information. Can you please go get us that more information? Come back to the board next month. I mean, it's it's none of those options, but it's showing we're at the table, we're interested, but we're just not informed enough to make a, a sound decision. Um, that, I, yeah, I, I mean, maybe that's, yeah, and monitor can mean the same thing, but maybe we could be very clear that we as a board have not made any position and we would like to ask for more information. I, uh, <laughs> Or yeah, we don't vote on anything. We're just asking for more information. Uh, Director Jones. I guess I would make a friendly amendment to your non-motion, uh, <laughs> which is, I, I think I've heard a lot of people say around this table, if we could have it, the great would be a statewide solution. So I would like to direct our lobbyists to say, go find out more information about this bill. Go find out how uh, we can best support and leverage a strong statewide solution as well. Do our lobbyists want to chime in real quick? <laughs> We're going to add mass chaos at the Capitol for you. Um, I just, I think the one thing that I would say about Dr. Cog being involved in a statewide solution and, and coming to the table, those negotiations are taking place at the highest level between the Speaker and the President and the Senate. It's, it's, it's above even our pay grade to get involved. I mean, it's it's so touchy at the moment. I mean, from, from, our, from our perspective. So, so you're, you're saying Dr. Cox should not get involved. I think we should be shown as a leader in the state that we are encouraging a statewide <laughs> solution, which I would think the rural parts of our state would be very excited that Dr. Cog was encouraging. I am not, no, I'm not oh, suggesting okay. that. No, no, no okay. not at all. I want Dr. Cog to be at the table. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Okay, Director uh, Wheelock. Uh, yeah, I think the idea that the largest MPO in the state, which would be the greatest <laughs> beneficiary of 1151, to take a position for a statewide solution would be a very strong statement to whoever else is talking about it, including under the dome and in the governor's mansion. And having been there recently, and having sat with a few other people in this room through his uh, think tank uh, you know, discussions, the first two meetings were people arguing about rural versus urban and Democrat versus Republican. The last of those meetings, we began, it took a completely different tone where people began to realize that the statewide solution is the only real solution. That the previous arguments that if we pass for example, 1151 or something like it, that it'll be easier to pass a statewide solution later on. Having observed how things happen down here at Dr. Cog, where everyone fights for his own community, it's hard to believe that once we voted to tax ourselves locally within our region, within our MPO, to create an RTA, that we would vote again for, for any small even amount to tax ourselves a second time to send the money to Durango is unlikely. Uh, it's, uh, the, the statement was also made that since we'll never achieve a statewide solution that because of that, that the boards of these different RTAs would, would vote to send some of the money that they collected within their own region elsewhere. Again, watching the conversations we have down there, that's a preposterous idea. So I think that the statewide solution is the only way to take care of the lane miles that the 83% of the population that lives within those five major MPO areas also travel on, seek all the goods that come to them, travel for work and travel for recreation and all the other things that they do. We'll never find a way to fix those roads properly and those areas will not happen through this measure, through 1151. The other thing I'd just like to say regarding, uh, I, I, I actually support the monitor and the reason I support monitor rather than do nothing is because to say, well, we'll take no position at all is to say, well, we won't take any position now and we'll just monitor it for now, which is pretty Same much thing. a monitor position, you know? So I think I would suggest a monitor at this time to stay at the table 
And again, the idea that the largest, the largest of the beneficiaries of something like this would say, no, we still support a statewide solution would somehow render themselves not in the conversation is also, you know, I think a pretty silly idea. I think anyone's going to listen to us. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick, Rich, did you want to chime in? Well, I, I just wanted to uh, mention maybe before we wrap up the conversation anyway, I think it would be good from staff's perspective to have some direction from the board whether or not you want us to pursue amendments. So whether if it's like monitor with amendments or monitoring or just we could do amending, but um, it, do you see what I'm getting at? If we're going to so-called be at the table, uh, we could even have a statement that we, you know, we, we understand the importance of a statewide solution and maybe that's even our preference. Uh, but with this bill being in existence and a serious option, uh, that maybe we should be also considering amendments, but I would like some direction from the board that, that we can actually pursue those. Okay, noted, uh, Director Zabo. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the last time. Um, it, it, they said the bill's going to committee in less than two weeks. When's our next meeting? The, the bill could be dead by then, and then we get no amendments, we get no nothing, we can't change to oppose, you know what I mean, if, if other things come down. So that there, there is some, some urgency. If, if every entity out there is opposing it, um, you know, CCI, CML, all of that, it could, it could just be gone by then. So I think we need to think long and hard. Do we really want to just meander through or do we want to take a position and hope it does go down the road so if we want to oppose it later, we can? Well, I think the motion is monitor. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and staff's asking for amendments, but I don't know if we're in a place. Uh, Director Maurer. Thank you. Um, I always like listening to everybody. It is fun. Oh, so, so different opinions. Um, but... but just seeing that uh, lack of support we're getting for transportation, so frustrating for all of us, I think. Um, we see the need, we come here, we talk about projects, and yet we have such limited budget. We're, we're, we're frustrated. Um, I did go to the meeting last Thursday, the uh, CML legislation, um, and they brought up different issues. The there, Casey Beckman was there, and she brought up something that was pretty interesting. Uh, when they put 110 um, out there, when they were raising money for uh, to try to, you know, um, get that bill passed, they only raised six million dollars. She said it takes at least 10 million dollars. So right there, they didn't even get initial support for that bill, and and so we're continuing to keep, you know, coming to the table saying where are we going to get more money? Where are we going to get more money? And, and even though this, you know, this bill needs some amendments, and, and it sounds like we all kind of get that, that it needs something and we would like to see what that means, it's, it's like we need to move forward with something because we're, we're, we're not, we don't have any, you know, solid ground right now and we're fighting that. And we're gonna continue to fight it, I think. Unless we as, you know, all of us come together and say, yes, all the cities will, you know, we want a statewide ballot. We're ready to put something together, and we're all going to support that. So we either got to go this way or we either got to fight the other way. So I'm kind of with monitor with amendments. <laughs> Director Teal. Well, thank you, Chairman. I'd like to speak in favor of the motion. Okay. It's pretty obvious that we, we, were, we don't want to oppose. We're not comfortable with the, with the support at this stage. And as far as Rich's request for direction from the board, I mean, uh, I, I, I would put forward that this is a, a, a motion should pass in order to amend. And quite frankly, I feel like, um, you know, Rich, we've, uh, you've got a lot of material here for amendments that have been expressed by the board. And we have, an offer, if I understand the the first, you know, 
presentation by the executive director, we do have an offer uh, to go back and participate in amendments. So, I mean, we've talked a lot, <laughs> but I really think the motion as it stands right now is appropriate. And I think uh, I, I would put forward that staff has the direction they need to, uh, um, to uh, uh, further amend this bill uh, as we've been invited to do. Yes, director. I don't have your last name. Sorry. Um, Allison Coombs from Coombs. Aurora. So I absolutely support the position of monitoring. I would question whether staff have any really clear direction on amendments, because I think there's like 12 different amendments floating around. So I think absolutely we should monitor this and see where it goes, but also whether that's tonight or at a work session, have some conversations about what specifically those amendments would be that people actually want. Because I think if staff took everything we've said to the bill's drafter, it would be completely ridiculous and not be anything any of us want. 900 page. <laughs> well, um, I do think we have a um, pretty good understanding of at least two amendments, the, a clear opt out and um, adding language in the hold harmless. <clears throat> yeah, that's maybe it's unclear beyond that. And so we're open to more <laughs> ideas. Well, well, but I think we have at least those two. Well, those are the amendments, but you, we should have an informal conversation around we still encourage a statewide statewide something to happen. I mean, it, it's not part of this bill, but we should be encouraging <laughs> that discussion. Uh, before I get to you, can I, can I talk since all of you have had like 10 bites of the apple? I'm the chair now, so <laughs> shouldn't you be asked? <laughs> I'm gonna call order, but it's uh, March 1st is yours. Uh, it, it, let me just throw s some of my, my thoughts. One, you know, this came out of the mayor's caucus, no offense to the mayors in the room, but it, it's a non-government board <laughs> who has pushed on to this effort, which I appreciate the fact that they are trying to help solve a regional issue. One thing I appreciate in this seat, and that those that have been past chairs, and there's quite a few around this room, I have a deepened appreciation of rural Colorado, and I have a deepened appreciation of the pool that Dr. Cog has. It's almost like a loaded weapon in a way. You, you don't want to point it unless you're going to use it, and because Dr. Cog is a huge influence in the rest of the state of where it goes. Um, and, and we have to be neighborly when we have these discussions and be thoughtful of those around us. I look at Clear Creek and the impacts you have going to the mountain towns. All the Denverites and all the Front Range drive through your county clog it up to get into the ski resort, but we don't want to pay for that. We don't want to pay for that. We, but we want to pay for us to get downtown, or we want to pay to maybe go down the block. But we're, but I work for CDOT during the day. We, cheese, we, ch we close down Clear Creek all the time. And, and why? It's because everyone goes up the mountain. So we, we just need to be thoughtful in our conversations. You know, and I listened to the Eastern TPR, the transportation planning in Eastern, they talk about, you know, their roads are not even wide enough for their tractors to move on and, and they're not even safe and they have more head on collisions. But the decisions we make in Denver completely impact Yuma County. You know, I, I just think we need to be a little bit thoughtful. I know it's all about us, me, 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 and my money, and, but I could guarantee you all my residents drive in every one of your communities all day long and beyond your borders. So. I, I get our amendments, and I'm good with where we are. And my mayor is probably the spearhead of this whole thing, so um, I'm sure he'll be pissed off if he heard how I felt about it. But he knows I'm not on board completely because I, I know, I know what these rural parts of the state do. I drive to Durango every other month. I drive to Grand Junction. I drive to these other places, and you see the impact the Front Range has on the rest of the state. But we don't want to pay for it. It's amazing. Anyway, so I'll get off my horse. It's, it's not too close to the door to the store. Let me get to uh, Director Dyack, and I'll come to Director Wheelock and Director I, Olson. I don't think I'm going to say anything. Okay. <laughs> Director Dyack. I, I just want to let the board know that in, in, in these fluid situations, um, at, at times, I think in the past, I recall that the, the board has given sort of direction for the staff um, to, to work with the executive team or the chair. As, as these things unfold. Um, again, I think we have a pretty big laundry list of, of things we can do, and it sounds like time is short. So, I mean, that could be also one option as well 
to um, to even add to the motion is as it as more information or as more discussions or negotiations, you can direct staff to work with chair or the or executive committee or something. Something, something like that. So, so we can we can have a say or a voice um, in in the process as it unfolds before we meet again. Yeah. So, Director Wheelock, uh, I appreciate your comments. Uh, while we were sitting recently, yesterday, having a discussion about combining our fire and EMS to try to make them more effective, um, I listened to two testimonies of people. Uh, EMS people who had um, lost their patients sitting in traffic, mm -hmm. not lost their patients, lost their patient sitting in traffic because they couldn't get to the hospital. Um, it, that isn't that, that shouldn't be as emotional for everyone as as because we're part of this uh, organization, and as the bill is written, I believe we would be beneficiaries like the rest of you who are MPO members. Um, but we're very um, sympathetic to the counties to the west of us who are not, who have said, my God, if this happens, is there a way that we can amend ourselves into Dr. Cog to save ourselves because we'll have no money mm -hmm. because it'll never happen for reasons I discussed a little while ago. Uh, you know, personally, I would like to make a friendly amendment that is in keeping with Director Jones' comment, not to try to, um, not to, try to say monitor with amendments because we can be here for days talking about what those amendments are. I, for example, would op op oppose the amendment to strengthen the hold harmless clause because that alone is indicative of the parochialism that we exhibit, uh, that we want to keep it here. <coughs> if we vote to tax ourselves, not only will we not vote to tax ourselves at the state level again to help those other areas, we want to make sure that CDOT doesn't even have the discretion to be able to send any of those funds, state or federal, anywhere else other than by current formulas because we don't want to lose a dollar of it. So I would suggest instead that we try to think about um, the benefit to the whole of a strong state transportation system and that we would monitor uh, with instructions to try to seek a statewide solution, whether a ballot solution or a legislative solution. And those discussions are happening at the Capitol right now about legislative solutions that don't even require a ballot. And they, what it's taking is for the first time, I'm hearing Democrats and Republicans coming together and saying, we've got to find a way to each of us give something. You know, we're, electric cars are going to have to pay a little more money. The gas tax or a gas fee may have to go up as well. And in addition to that, we may have to plunder the general, the general fund for a portion of this. Everybody's going to have to give something that they don't like giving in order to get something that they want. And I think that's the only way we're going to reach it is when we recognize that without all the roads in the state and all the people in the state, we can't really do this. We can't do it in a meaningful fashion. Mm -hmm. And so I would, uh, again, suggest that we monitor, that we stick to the existing amendment, but we could do a friendly amendment that instructs um, our staff to monitor uh, uh, or to, to lobby heavily for a statewide solution that is legislative or ballot driven, either one, to try to help find, to forge those alliances to find that solution. Uh, Director Shaw. I'd like to call the question. Okay, thank you. Amen. Okay, so what I have uh, down is a motion uh, to monitor with amendments. I haven't heard the amendment part, so. I think that's implicit. Okay. That's why we're monitoring. Okay, and do we have a second? <laughs> well, with the with I'm amendments that. that we're stressing that we want them to add in. Okay. Uh, do we have a second? Uh, oh yeah, we're doing the call to question. Those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstention? Okay, so call the question. So now the motion is uh, monitor with the um, amendments that we've talked about. Those in, uh, do I have a second on that one? I don't think I have a second. Yeah, I, I gave you a second. You did? Oh, that's right. Uh, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, raise so your raise your hands for now. Point of order. I want to restate the motion. Okay. Because I, I heard Direct Director Quinn. I mean Flynn. Flynn. <laughs> I thought he said monitor. Said what? Yes, he, he did. Monitor. That was right. the motion. Right. So. To include. There was no vote on amendments. There was no vote on amendments. That was the first. 
the vote we just did. So the, the, that's point of order call. was to call a question. So we voted on call the question. Oh. That's what we did. Oh, Second, okay. sorry, I should have clarified that. Second okay. was monitor, but we want to monitor with amendments to the bill. Is that clear or no? Well, let's ask Director Flynn. Mo my motion is to monitor. Okay. The, bo the, board, the board's direction beyond the motion is that we are working toward amendments in those areas that we've just discussed, the opt-out. Do does anyone feel that we need to make that clear in our motion? Is that fine? Well, I also thought there was direction around um, pursuing a state solution. Right. Yeah, our preference. So I, I feel like the direction is separate from the motion, and that's fine, but we should mm -hmm. fine. State should, the, the staff should be clear on what we're right. giving you as guidance. S so let's, let's do the motion Pretty on clear. monitor. <laughs> let's just make sure, let's just do the motion on monitor. And then the discussion around what we would like the bill right. to look like, I think the staff has got it. So right. let's revote on the motion is to just monitor. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? So raise your hand for opposed. Three, uh, four. Abstention? That carries. Any other discussion around that? Are we good? Staff? Rich? Um, I feel like I have the direction from the board on the two amendments plus a statement of uh, support for a statewide uh, solution. All right. Thank you very much. Wait, hold on. Sorry. Director Dyack brought up a point that if things are flying fast, do we yes. need anyone to weigh in at the time? Do you want to assign the executive committee to weigh in on if there's quick, quick questions as it's going through? Legislators, do we need a motion around that to empower <laughs> us to? I'll move to. Okay. Allow the executive committee to move in and if help need, need if need be. be. Okay. So I drive a we second. don't want to move in. Yeah. Yeah. We just want to talk. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Use not. public transit doing those in, fa <laughs> those in favor cool. say aye. 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 Opposed. Abstention. All right, that carries. Thank you very much. And Dale. And I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the healthy and thoughtful conversation. Um, next up, we are going to one? not have the informal briefings on item number 13. Yeah. I'm assuming we'll be talking about that later. We will. We, we will be bringing back criteria for that call for projects um, in the next few months. So we're moving right along on to number 14, the 10 year, CDOT 10 year strategic pipeline attachment I uh, in your packet. Um, Ron Papsdorf, um, you're up. I'd like to move that we hold the legislative conversations to the end of the agendas from now on. Because <laughs> now I'm feeling like, uh, so anyways, we'll, we'll try to get through these last two items um, as quickly as possible, but they are important, so I don't want to rush too far. Um, so on this item, the CDOT 10-year strategic pipeline conversation, um, I'm really just going to introduce uh, very briefly some, some background information for you, and then I'm going to hand off to CDOT to speak to. But as um, relayed in the staff report in your package under attachment I, um, CDOT is in the process of developing their latest version of their statewide transportation plan. Um, as part of that process, they've um, uh, determined through the commission that they want to identify sort of a, I'm going to call it a 10-year pipeline, but it's really sort of a six-year six pipeline beyond the next four years that um, includes our TIP and the statewide transportation improvement program. Um, and this is an exercise to identify sort of priorities around the state assuming that if the equivalent of about $500 million a year became available for that six-year period, so $3 billion available statewide, <laughs> if that became available through some mechanism, the legislature, voters, whoever, that the state had identified a set of priority projects around the state that they would um, fund with those new, um, those new funds. Um, so the commission gave direction to staff uh, utilizing uh, that $3 billion, they set a target for each of the five CDOT regions, including Region 1, which is entirely uh, within Dr. Cog, and CDOT Region 4, of which C uh, Dr. Cog includes a portion, including Boulder County and Southwest okay. Weld County portions of Dr. Cog in Region 4. So each of those regions had targets uh, to pursue. 
the region one target is a little over a billion dollars total. That's highway and transit. That's in your staff report. For region four, I forget what region four's total target was, but of the region four total target, since there are four transportation planning regions in uh, region four of, doc of uh, CDOT, which is Boulder, Weld, and sort of Northeast Colorado, uh, there are four transportation planning regions. Um, the region, region four and those TPRs together elected to identify a target for each of the transportation planning regions um, to propose sort of project priorities and then the four TPRs, uh, Chair Pfeiffer was involved in those conversations with the other TPRs within region four and with region four staff to work through and come up with a set of priority projects in, in region four. So the Dr. Cog portion of the target for region four was $21 million of transit priorities and $141 million in, in change uh, for the highway capital <laughs> side. Um, overall, the Transportation Commission set some framework, so they uh, again set aside at least 10% to go to transit improvement projects statewide. Um, of the highway funds, um, 25, at least 25% focused on rural pavement condition projects and 75% for other highway kind of capital projects. But of those highway funds, a total target goal of achieving at least 50% of the total being spent to improve asset condition on CDOT facilities around the state. Um, so what you have in the package are the draft lists that have been developed through the consultation process so far uh, between Dr. Cog and Region 1 and Dr. Cog and the other three TPRs and Region 4. Uh, so those were included in your packet. Um, those, are, those went to stack last Friday for initial consultation. They'll go to, did they go to commission today, Rebecca? Thank you, Rebecca's nodding her head. Um, and I think, and Rebecca can speak to this, but I think the target is for the commission ultimately to adopt the statewide list in a couple of months or so. So with that framework, hopefully that's enough. I'd be happy to answer any questions about the process, but I would like to hand off to, I think Paul Josaitis, the region one RTD is here um, to talk about the region one list and in the absence of Region 4 staff, I think Rebecca is going to talk to the uh, Region 4 list. Thanks, Ron. Uh, so uh, if you don't know me, my name is Paul Jusaitis. I'm CDOT's Region 1 Director. Been in that role for about five years and 21 years at CDOT. So anyway, um, we spent a lot of time this summer and we uh, went and talked to all of our eight counties, talked to a lot of the local jurisdictions. Many of you were probably part of those uh, lengthy discussions. Um, really a huge effort to go out and, and uh, talk to everybody and listen. Um, and you know, it's always good to talk about transportation. So that has uh, culminated into where we are today. And um, hopefully in front of you, you all have a list for Region 1, which is uh, what we have is 26 projects. It's roughly 23 highway uh, um, and three that are um, designated as transit projects. And so um, I'm not going to go through all 26 projects with you all because uh, we'd be here another couple hours. But I am um, happy to talk about any that you might have questions on. Um, I'll tell you, it was a very difficult thing to call our list, which was about uh, $5 billion of projects in Region 1. And so we have one, about $1 billion above the line that we prioritized. And these were projects that we thought in Region 1 that we could deliver in the next 10 years pretty easily because they're in some state of uh, project development already, whether it's NEPA or some, even some level of preliminary design. And, um, and so that's kind of how we put that list together. We talked extensively with uh, Dr. Cog, and, um, and so you have that list. So I'll tell you that uh, that four billion that's below the line, they're all good projects, and so there are some losers in this whole thing, but I hope you all can see that the projects that we do have above that 
line are some really good projects that focus on things like pedestrian safety. We had 78 pedestrian deaths across the state of Colorado last year. And so uh, we focused a lot of our resources in doing things that would just make our system more safe. And a lot of times when our system is safer, we also see reduced congestion and those kind of things. So um, with that, I don't know, Rebecca, you want to add anything to it? Or, or if you all have questions, I'd love to answer them. Any questions for Mr. Josidis? Yes. Uh, I don't know your last name. Is it Director Sutton? Yeah. Did you catch that? Yeah, so I'll repeat the question. So the Morrison <laughs> Dinosaur Lot, you you probably, most of you are familiar, it's that lot at exit 259 where uh, the, the skiers park, CDOT owns that, that lot, and we're looking at making that a Bustang uh, uh, transit type center. So we're looking at a lot of multimodal um, hubs across Interstate 25 and I-70. So we're, so we're also looking at participating in years one through four with the Idaho Springs uh, park and ride there. So this is just another multimodal hub along Interstate 70. We also have a multitude of multimodal hubs along I-25. Thank you, Director Stolzman and then Director Elrod. Thank you very much. Um, so in the Region 4 list, when we sent our section of the Region 4 list for the TPR chairs to review, State Highway 42 was fully funded uh, when it went forward. Um, in that discussion with the TPR chairs, um, you know, Director Pfeiffer was there uh, advocating, trying to, to work on our behalf, but the, the, we're outnumbered in Region 4. We don't have a majority say, and uh, State Highway 42, the funding was cut down um, from 40 million to 26 million. And so let me just tell you a little bit about the history on State Highway 42. Um, it's similar in volume to like a ridge gate if you're from down south in um, traffic each day. Um, it's a major highway that cuts through our city where we get a lot of folks that are trying to get to work in Boulder or you know to and from work in other communities. It's about 60% background traffic that's not from our community. Um, we were successful in our subregion in funding design for, for that project. So we're going to be doing the design work starting in 2021 for that project. So to have the funding moved out entirely is, is disheartening and disappointing. Um, currently, the city of Louisville is paying for the improvements on Highway 42 because we're not getting the support needed because there's not sufficient funding from the state. So city of Louisville is paying 100% for a signal that's required. City of Louisville is paying 100% for pedestrian improvements that were required. City of Louisville paid 100% for the underpass that was required to connect a bus stop to the senior um, and affordable housing. So we're, we're pitching in and we've set money aside in our budget for this project. And so to have the other TPR chairs vote and move the money from our projects out to I-25 is pretty frustrating. And so I'd ask um, that we restore the funding to Highway 42. And I think the only way to harmoniously do that is to take it from within our section of Region 4 from other projects because there's only 100% of the funding. Um, so I would ask if there's any interest from other folks in Region 4 um, to look at the balance of the projects and say, I, I know we are, we've all committed to 119 and Highway 7 and making sure those are whole, but the study's not done on 287 yet, and we'll all be working on 7 and 119, which we've talked about that might delay the 287 work a little bit. So I wonder if we could take some of the money from 287 and partially refund it. Um, the Highway 42 project, which is going to be in design in 2021. Go ahead. Uh, hi, and good evening, everyone. Rebecca White again with CDOT. So I, we had hoped we would have Region 4 represented here tonight. Um, that office is based in Greeley. We're trying to walk the talk and not get on our roads when they're not in great shape, and there's quite a snowstorm tonight, so they couldn't make it down. So I, I can't dive into the specifics with you on that project. What I can offer is just a little bit more background on the process. Ron did a, a nice job of describing the CDOT administrative region that is Region 4 is very large. It's about a third of the state. So the four transportation planning regions represent an area all the way from Fort Collins down out to the borders of Nebraska and Kansas. Um, it was a, quite a good compromise process to arrive at that list. It sounds like you were involved in those discussions um, with a lot of the, the TPR chairs wanting to try to prioritize some of these state uh, I-25 investments. Um, 
all I can offer is that this is a draft list. That's why we're bringing it to you all to have these kind of conversations. And if Dr. Cog wants to weigh back in, we're still working on this and it can go back to those TPR chairs. I was your TPR chair there. So part of the conversation was around state significant funding, you know, over state significant roads like interstates. One of the discussions was there is a, a segment of, an, of I-25 in Region 4 that's in Dr. Cog, correct me if I'm wrong, right, Ron? Yes, correct. That is the choking point now with all the Section 7 and 8, if I call that correctly, where I think it's Section 5 and 6 are, are in down this way, and we're not putting any money to fix that. Um, and so the ask of the region's TPRs was, can people contribute to some of the I-25 improvements? Right, so just to be clear, my proposal did not take the money away from that area. I was asking if other folks in Region 4 wanted to weigh in on the other Region 4 projects. And there are representatives that live in Region 4. Are you asking even the board members to weigh in on the projects that are on the list that were vetted? Okay. So Mr. Mr. Chair, if I might, I, th yeah. I, think, I think it would be helpful. I think this, this, this is a zero-sum game. Um, we were provided a target. Um, I, th I think we've represented the right priority list of projects. Um, if there is some discussion to have, I, I think we'd be happy to get input from the um, Boulder County and Southwest Weld jurisdictions about this specific list. And uh, to Mayor Stoltzman's request, um, if the other region four member jurisdictions that have interest in the other projects on the list would be willing to reduce the funding level for say US 287 to allow more money to be um, shown on the list for State Highway 42, that would be good guidance for us to be, be able to provide to CDOT tonight. Uh, Director Jones. I guess the request is taking me a little bit by surprise. I mean. The the best place to have this conversation would be at the US 36 MCC table, where we ask staff to put together the 10-year project list. So I feel a little bit, me reacting tonight on my own, um, on that request would not be good process. So I guess I'm not in a position to move money around tonight and pretend that I'm representing the other jurisdictions in the MCC. Um, so I, if if this decision needs to be made tonight, I, I don't think. I, 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 I Dr. Think we Director Jones, I think, I think there's some time in the CDOT process. Again, this is still draft. CDOT's still seeking input. Um, I will take the opportunity while I'm up here and I have the mic to also remind the board that this is for maybe money <laughs> for a six-year period. Uh, remember that we are, we are also in the process of developing our 2050 regional transportation plan that will set out a financially constrained investment strategy and priority projects for the entire region. So this, is, uh, this exercise, this process will be very informative to that and it's a good process to go through, a good conversation to have and it will inform that. But ultimately um, what, what will be really important is we get the right projects at the right funding amount in that financially constrained RTP that you all are, will be working on with us over the course of this year and adopting early in 2021. Uh, Director Elrod. Um, so based on that, I'm hearing two things. So one, if money becomes available, and two, if you're above the line on this. So when I look at um, a multi-jurisdiction project, which is the um, the US 85 uh, that did not make the list. And so I'm looking at a minimum of 10 years um, and even beyond potentially. So how do I need to, you know, what am I needing to take back? Are, are we essentially saying we are doing a PAL study now in that region, but we will not be able to implement or execute on any of those findings at least a decade away. Yeah, and can you clarify which project on 85 are, are you, are you so speaking of? So it's the post-PEL Santa Fe improvements and US 85 mineral interchange. Cause we're, we're currently going through the PEL um, now. Oh, you're just in the very beginning of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, yes, yeah, so uh, the list that we have above the line is about a billion dollars, and um, that is for years six through 10. And that year six through 10 is completely unfunded at this point. And it really makes the assumption that the legislature continues to provide an additional $500 million per year to total $3 billion like they have done in years one through four, right? And so, um, yes, if your project's not shown in years six through 10, um, that certainly would imply that it's gonna be a little bit farther out. On the other hand, I think a lot of things may change over the next four years, and we may see some shuffling of projects. Now, with that being said, that's a still a pretty big list, and we also, um, on that list that we're showing for a billion dollars, we are also assuming toll revenue to uh, enhance that fund. So that billion dollar list is actually a, a much uh, bigger project than, uh, you know, much bigger amount than that. So example of that would be um, I-25, 84th to 104th. We're only showing 70 million in for that very important project, but we do feel like there could be local participation and we feel like there could be toll revenue on, and there is toll revenue at corridor to help. Um, so it's more grim than you're even talking about. Right. Yes. <laughs> and, and by the way, you know, with a smile. And, and it just Set builds it on that question: Do we have money for transportation? And and it's a very real problem, at least for me at CDOT. So you should have brought your monopoly money as a prop. Yes, <laughs> direct, direct, to monitor it, Director yeah. Mauer. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Josidas, I was just wondering, um, uh, there's a couple items here where they are bunching projects. And with them being, uh, well, and, and maybe Ron can answer this as well, but um, there might be some low-hanging fruit for local participation from some of us for the line item urban arterial unfunded list. So you know, if you just get a little bit of money and if, you know the local has a little bit of money, we might be able to work something out if we know what those are. Uh, same thing with the bottleneck reduction and the, I think the region one arterial transit, isn't that sidewalk? Yes, yeah, so we deliberately left region one arterial transit. It's, that's the, it shows 75 million <laughs> on your line item there. And it's actually reduced to 70 million because we did add one additional project in there that's not shown in, the li in this draft list. And that was State Highway 7 and I-25. We put 10 million in there just to think about some early action transit type enhancements for that interchange, which is growing pretty quick. But so that, uh, just to go back to your question, the 70 million or what you're seeing at 75 million we left generic because we don't know exactly what those projects are at this point, but they could be for things like uh, Colfax BRT or Federal Boulevard BRT. Um, but at this point, we don't even know if those uh, transit type elements uh, will even work, right? So we left that one pretty generic. And just to kind of build on uh, what Ron was saying, in, in years one through four, we have this nice $25 million urban arterial program, which is also being leveraged with $26 million of transit. And then uh, I think the number is 17 million of STBG statewide and nine and a half of STBG Dr. Cog. So we're looking at over $100 million of um, unidentified projects that we're gonna be doing a call for projects in the next few months. And, that, and all you're talking about is a continuation of that, um, what we're hoping is a real good program. Thank you. I, I would I'd like to thank Commissioner Jones and t take you up on your effort. So my under, my understanding is that the list as we're seeing it tonight is not what the Mayors and Commissioners Coalition had sent forward and that it was modified at, by another group. And it, instead of sending it back to us and saying, how would you want to reallocate the funds, it was just done. So I think taking you up on your offer of bringing it back to the group and then um, trying to amend it with um, Ron outside the meeting is, is a good one. And I appreciate the suggestion. Yeah. The, the letter that was received, and we appreciate that input from the US 36 Mayors and Commissioners Coalition, that was an unconstrained list that we got. So in our work with the other TPRs, we- Are enthusiastic. We were, we, were, <laughs> we were trying to kind of balance that input, which was really helpful, get the right projects on the list, knowing that we had to take 
that very big list and constrain it to the target that we were provided. Did you put rel in that list while you were at it? I thought you might get excited. Also, I, just to address the, the funding issue again, and I, just, I can't stress this enough, this is six years worth of maybe money that was set at assuming $500 million a year that may come about. We will be developing a 2050 RTP that will look at the next 30 years worth of priorities. And just per, for perspective, you all allocate $350 million to $400 million every four years through the TIP process of real federal dollars to go to real investment. So over that 30 year period, that's about $3 billion of investment. So as part of those conversations around the RTP, we'll be setting what projects we really intend to fund over that 30 year period with real dollars that we expect to have during that time period. And we'll make some assumptions <laughs> about some potential additional revenue so that we have a little bit of flexibility in developing those priorities in that list of projects. As Director uh, Shaw would say, it's, hey, remember, it's on the list. That's a good part, right? So on the list. Uh, once it's on the list, that's a good chance one day we may or may not be here. Uh, okay. <laughs> we might get some funding. All right. Any other questions or comments? All can, right. I, can I just close out the, the purpose door. of this now that Ron made me feel bad about my list? <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, we do intend to start to socialize this as a draft list, so just for the board to know that we'll start to get this out. We've talked to a lot of groups this summer, and we want to circle back with them and show what their input has achieved. So you'll start to see this. It's going to have draft all over it. We, we expect it'll be um, refined, but just to not be surprised that we'll start to use this document a little. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so moving on to what, our last informational item, maybe? <laughs> Number 15, State Highway Urban Arterial Safety and Mobility Improvements Concept, Attachment J. Mr. Ron Papstorf. <coughs> Thank you, Chuck. Good evening again. Um, I want to I want to preface this with um, this is a really important conversation for you all tonight, and um, we're presented uh, with some real problems in this region. And um, I come to you with an opportunity for you to consider. Um, this item is related to urban arterial safety and mobility around the region. Um, based on feedback from you all and priorities that you've established and the allocation of Senate Bill 267, Senate Bill 1, and Senate Bill 262 money that CDOT and through the commission allocated last year to important projects. Region 1 really stepped up to the plate, heard us about the importance of dealing with state highway urban arterials around this region, and as part of their process, allocated $25 million for urban arterial safety-focused improvements around the region on the state highway corridors in Region 1. <clears throat> can't give Paul enough credit for stepping up to the plate and doing that because um, that was a tough decision because there's lots of competing needs. Um, and also $26 million of transit funds from Region 1, um, real dollars to invest in transit improvements, again, on state highway corridors within Region 1 part of Dr. Cog. But again, that only deals with the Region 1 part of Dr. Cog. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about an opportunity to deal with um, an important issue. So safety is a huge issue um, in this region. <laughs> Um, we've been doing work uh, with all the local jurisdictions around the region to develop a regional Vision Zero plan to drive down uh, fatal accidents and serious injury crashes um, around the region. And just per, for perspective, some of the data we've gathered, <clears throat> in 2017, 266 people were killed in crashes on Denver region streets and highways. Uh, that's just one year. Um, there were 8,700 crashes in five years between 2013 and 17 that resulted in fat a fatality or a severe injury. 8,700 crashes that were re resulted in a fatality or a serious crash, crash around this region in five years. Um, almost 1,150 people died in the Denver region on roadways during that same five-year period. So this is a significant issue that we face uh, through the Regional Vision Zero Plan that we hear about, I think, next month. You know, we're trying to develop some real concrete strategies to deal with this issue. Um, for perspective, um, about 95% of crashes on the regional system involve automobiles. 
Only 3% involve pedestrians or bicyclists, but pedestrian and bicyclist crashes represent 25% um, of fatal accident, fatal crashes. So disproportionately represented in, in those um, issues. As part of the Vision Zero plan, we've developed, uh, identified a high entry network that represents about 28% of the region, region's major, major roads um, <laughs> and highways. They represent 75% of fatal and severe injury crashes around the region. So we have a real opportunity through some targeted investments to address some of the um, key issues. <laughs> As I mentioned, with the Region 1 um, allocation of Senate Bill 267 money, we have also found we also um, found out that CDOT received a supplemental apportionment of federal funds, surface transportation block grant funds, totaling about $37 million to Colorado. $9 million through the SDBG Metro portion would come to Dr. Cog to be directed by Dr. Cog, about $3 million to other MPOs, $7 million for the small urban and rural areas, $17 million that CDOT would have available to spend anywhere in the state. So through conversations between Dr. Cog and CDOT, uh, we came up with this concept where CDOT would be willing to leverage their $17 million, invest that in the Denver region, the entire Dr. Cog region. <clears throat> if Dr. Cog came to the table and said, the $9 million that's normally directed by Dr. Cog will leverage, will bring to the table to match, to create a new set-aside program focused on urban arterial safety, uh, multimodal improvements around the region. There are some real pros and cons for you to consider, but before I get into those, just to make your conversation that much more difficult and complicated, we just, just got updated financial information from CDOT, and we also found out that we've had a project from the previous TIP return um, money um, to the TIP. So in addition to this $9 million, and I want to talk about, there's also about $11 million more that will come back and be available to allocate um, to the TIP. We're not proposing that be included in the set aside that would go through the normal wait list protocol. But the issue with this particular proposal, I wanted to make sure you had the full picture that there's also additional money that's coming back that will go through that waiting list process. So some of the pros around this particular concept are this opportunity to focus some real investment dollars into a critical problem in the region um, on those locations of the highest injury and crash locations, an opportunity to leverage that $9 million of Dr. Cog directed SDBG funds that we didn't originally anticipate two to one with the $17 million coming from CDOT. And it allows the use of those SDBG funds to focus on this problem for the entire MPO boundary, not just the region one part of Dr. Cog. Obviously, the challenge with this is it will require an exception <laughs> to our current TIP waiting list protocol that you all adopted as part of the TIP policy in developing the 2020 to 23 TIP. And the funds would be targeted as, uh, as a set-aside program um, to the region through a selection process not allocated by the sub-regional process that we used to select projects through that TIP process. So just quickly to remind you of that waitlist protocol, basically if new revenue that was not originally anticipated during the TIP process becomes available during the period of the TIP, um, that represents either $2 million total or an amount equal to the next in line waitlist project. We go through this waitlist process, we go to the sponsor of the next rank, the first rank project on the wait list. We say, we've got this much money available. <coughs> Can you use it to fund that project? If it's less than what is necessary or was originally requested to deliver that project, the ask is, can you use this federal fund and still come up with more money to fully deliver the project? If the sponsor says no, then we go to the next rated projects and so forth and so on down that priority list. So for perspective, if you take the $9 million that is unanticipated, and through our waitlist protocol, separate that out 20% to the regional share, 80% split among the eight subregions. This is how that money gets split up, $1.8 million regional share, and you can read the rest of the list. Some of the subregions have projects that could utilize that amount of money, many don't. Um, so that's sort of the issue, but the real trade-off becomes, do you wanna kind of take this money, maybe be able to use it, hold on to it until more money becomes available so you can fund a project on your wait list or leverage the $9 million with $17 million of CDOT-directed SDBG funds to create this new set-aside program 
one time an exception to the waitlist process to focus on safety mobility problems on arterial corridors around the region. And again, since these are federal dollars, they would not be limited just to state highway arterial corridors, they would be available to arterial corridors generally around the region. Um, goals for the project, and these are still in flux, we're, we're having conversations with CDOT, but I think these generally capture the overall theme of what we, with the intent behind the set-aside program would be. It would really be focused on improving safety for all modes, especially those vulnerable users of the transportation system um, <coughs> with kind of sub-priorities of improving transit connectivity and multimodal mobility around the region. Um, some considerations to think about in terms of how projects would be selected or priorities for identifying uh, those projects. Um, obviously, facilitate facilities with high crash history or on the high injury network, um, routes with existing transit service or, and or future BRT corridors. So we're trying to make that safety and multimodal kind of connection uh, corridors that serve major centers that are identified around the region. So those activity centers where lots of, that, lots of that activity is happening or will happen collaboration between jurisdictions, so would be interested in projects that serve multiple jurisdictions or span jurisdictional boundaries. Um, public support, readiness, and local match, since these are federal funds, they do require a local match. Um, we'll have an opportunity, to, as a set aside, there would be an opportunity to weigh in on the specific criteria, just like you all do with any set aside program that you all create. Um, the selection process that we envision uh, would be um, to respect the sub-regional process, to solicit project ideas through and applications through the sub-regions, so you all collaborate and develop priorities with the sub-regions to submit projects, and then selection uh, with uh, CDOT, RTD, Dr. Cog, and a representative from each of the sub-regions participating in actually selecting the projects to use the funds. I think still open to discussion between Dr. Cog and CDOT if this were to move forward, would be how much or if we partner and completely merge all the funds, the Region 1, Senate Bill 267 funding, the 25 and the 26, with this pot of funding and do one call of projects for the whole thing Region 1, respecting that the Senate Bill 267 money is state-only money, some flexibility there, and the SDBG funds are federal funds, a little less flexibility, and also that the Region 1 money is just for the portion of Region 1 and the SDBG would be available for the entire region. So with all that background, I'd be happy to take any questions on that general feed, on that general background, but a couple of discussion items. First is, should we consider a one-time exception to the TIP waiting list protocol in order to leverage the $9 million of Dr. Cog directed SDPG funds with $17 million of CDOT SDPG funds for an urban arterial safety and mobility improvements set aside program? That's first discussion item. Further note, just to add one more nuance, this is not just a Dr. Cog board decision, this is also a Transportation Commission decision. So the, CEDA, the Colorado Transportation Commission will also have to agree that they're willing to take $17 million of federal funds that is available to them to spend anywhere in the state and direct it solely to the Denver region. Well, we'll start with Director Elrod. Hey, you're gonna have to go through those numbers again. <laughs> um, so there is a total of 51 million that's from CDOT and that's committed. And then there's an opportunity to leverage the STBG for an additional 37 million only if 9 million comes from Dr. Cog and 70 million from CDOT and then the pieces in the middle? Yeah, Director Elrod, just to, so the Colorado got an additional sort of supplemental apportionment of a total of 37. This proposal is to take 17 of that and leverage it with nine that would normally flow directly through Dr. Cog to create an additional $26 million in addition to the $51 million that Region 1 has allocated from Senate Bill 267 funding. So in total, there's a potential of $76 million? Did I do my math? 70, 76, $77 million or so, yeah. Director uh, Jones. But the question is whether or not we want to use our $9 million to leverage $17 million from CDOT, and why the heck wouldn't we? Right. <laughs> 
Yeah. I, I mean, that seems like money. a no-brainer to me. You're focusing on safety, which I think is a total priority for all of our jurisdictions in the region as a general, and in general. And I, I do think, um, you know, it, the, we'll have to make our case to the Transportation Commission on why this is so important, but I think we should absolutely try. Um, this is a priority, and to leverage that kind of money doesn't <coughs> show up that often. So thank you, CDOT, and I would say yes. Just to, uh, and if any of the board members that were at RTC tomorrow morning also would want to weigh in, we had a good robust conversation about this at the RTC meeting yesterday morning. Um, I think four transportation commissioners were in attendance yesterday yes. morning and enthusiastically supportive. Yeah, they, they're on board. Uh, Director Williams. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I would just second what Director Jones said. I think the opportunity to leverage this and um, turn this nine into 26 is too good of an opportunity to pass up. And to really, I, I know for, for City and County of Denver, and I know uh, pretty much all of the neighboring area in the Dr. Cog region, safety is such a huge focus. And so I think to be able to attack it with a large pot of regional funding is a great opportunity. Yes, uh, Director Sandgren. <laughs> Thank you. So obviously, whenever we get an extra pile of money, it's great to be able to use it um, regionally. Who would be doing the scoring on the process, I guess, and how would we make sure that that was transparent to make sure that there was equity? Because it's not really going to be brought back directly to each of our subregion groups the way that it was with the TIPS process, correct? Um, Director Sanger, that's correct. So as, just like our other set-aside programs that are, are <coughs> regional focus, focused on the highest needs against the criteria that are set for that set aside. This would be a regional, a regional look, and to try to bridge and acknowledge the important role of the subregions. That's why I'm proposing that as part of that selection process, we would have representation from each of the subregions involved in that process. Um, it does not mean that funds would be allocated proportionally, like the the overall TIP selection process for the subregions, but we want those voices involved in the process to identify the priorities and, and get the best set of, of priorities around the region. And there are certainly there are certainly some maybe somewhat larger corridor projects that could really have an impact, but I think there are also there's a variety of different safety needs around the region. I think there are also some really small targeted strategic improvements that can be made that can have a real impact on safety as well. So I think there's room for lots of different types of projects and improvements to address specific safety needs. And I think the Vision Zero work and CDOT's um, uh, statewide safety initiative really will help us focus on sort of priority opportunities and the right solutions in the right places because these safety issues are complex and what's in impacting safety and fatal crashes at one location may not be the same factors that are influencing them at another. So you, there are specific solutions. This is not a one size fits all. And then just to follow up, would we have a new criteria process for identifying which project rises to the top and who would be in charge of that? Yeah, director, uh, uh, this would be a cooperative process between Dr. Cog and CETA. I think we both would have a strong voice. I think we're, we're pretty aligned in terms of the generally what we want to achieve with this. Um, my proposal would be, since, since Dr. Cog is, w the, to exercise this would be making an exception, uh, an affirmative exception to an existing wait list policy in the TIP um, and creating the set aside that ultimately the, the parameters, the criteria, that process that's negotiated between CDOT and Dr. Cog would have to come back to this board just like other set-aside programs. Yes, Director Shaw and then Director Dyack. Thank you. Uh, my question is about the money and whether or not there are any uh, types of roads that are excluded on this. Uh, just out of pure curiosity, I think it's the right thing to do. It's, uh, it's always about the money, Director Shaw. Um, <laughs> <laughs> these are these are federal funds, so um, right out the bat, any any sort of not any any facility that's not federal aid eligible is off the table, and those are generally local streets and some minor collector streets, generally 
federal aid projects are collectors and above classification. Um, obviously, with a lot of the work that we've done with your jurisdictions on developing the regional vision zero plan, we have a pretty good sense of where the significant needs are. I think certainly the, the purpose that CDOT and Dr. Cog staff have is to focus on those, that high injury network um, and focus on where those major safety needs are to the extent that we can start to make a dent on some of those. Uh, Ron, so with with the new 11 million, I know it's not it's not relevant to this, but to me, um, I, I like the scenario model in my head and figure out the outs. Um, if 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 this is not supported, not to say I'm I'm in dissent, but if this is not supported, um, the nine million would go with the 11 million and be allocated per per our current tip policy, right? So the the nine million basically would would double up and. You know, I guess in my case, Douglas County would get you know, 0.5, 1.6, as opposed to 700 grand. Chair Elect Dyack, that's exactly right, and that's why I wanted to be real transparent as we got really fresh new information. I want to make sure you had the full picture of those trade-offs. So the good news is, with your, <coughs> your blessing to move forward and pursue this, um, that there's still additional money coming in to be distributed through the wait list. Um, so we're not losing the opportunity to fund some other projects because of because of a project turn back and some additional revenue um, above what was originally projected when we did the tip. Um, the bad news is, I guess, what makes it more complicated for you is it's not just a matter of sort of making a decision to trade off sort of this nine million dollars as it's allocated here. It's about double these numbers. Um, that potentially could go if you elected not to leverage the $9 million of the 17. So um, that's real fresh information. We just wanted to be real transparent with um, all that information so you had that and thought about that as you deliberated this proposal. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Director Olson. I, I'm really supportive of this. I think it's an amazing opportunity to do something that could be I mean, it's obviously it's life-saving, right? But I, I think of a number of things. If the subregions are involved, you've got a diverse group of people looking uh, throughout the area. It makes it much more open and transparent, and you've got diverse perspectives. I think that ensures the process. And the second thing is that all the subregions working together on anything is always a positive in my mind, that it keeps building this sense of our team, of how we look out for one another and making decisions where we have to pick one over the other. And, and the last thing is that uh, regardless of where is picked for safety improvements, any of us could be in those areas. We're all, we're all part of this region. We don't stay in our houses all day long and not you know, go somewhere else. So safety for one is safety for all in many ways. So I, I, I think this is a tremendous opportunity. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? All right. Just the last question, um, I'll, I'll flip back to that slide, but if you have any particular thoughts or if we're sort of really off base or heading in the wrong direction around sort of the, the general criteria that we've set here, knowing that you all will have sort of a second bite at sort of weighing in on a lot more details as we work through that, would be um, happy to entertain that. And after that, I just would ask for sort of an affirmative head nod that you're comfortable with us moving forward with this because we'd like to try to move this along if there's agreement to do it and try to get this in front of TAC for action item uh, sooner rather than later because I know CDOT's interested in getting this front in front of commission for a decision as well, kind of striking while the iron's hot. So. Uh, Director Sutton. Yeah, um, my question on, on the criteria for deciding this, I, I would like to think that <laughs> human behavioral elements get included in this, like if these deaths are associated with alcoholism, those kinds of things, how that comes into play in deciding kinds of things. I'm all for you leveraging this money, and I'm just curious if you just make dots on a map. Yeah. Um, is it near bars? What, what other kind of human behavioral elements could come into that? Yeah, Director, it, it, I, oh, sorry. I just wonder if you spend money on transportation when really the money would have been better spent on drug abuse prevention or something. Director, I really appreciate the comment. And when we look at safety, there really are three key elements to attract to attacking the safety issue. It is education, enforcement, and engineering. These dollars can only be spent on the engineering side, so we're trying we're trying to address that piece here. Uh, the Vision Zero plan has a strategy and a t some tactics that are much more 
far reaching and go beyond the engineering but it's an important piece of that triad of issues to try to attack and you know i totally agree though those issues that education enforcement piece are equally as important but this funding can only be spent on sort of that engineering kind of physical infrastructure improvement piece director teal thank you chairman hey ron so can you tell us talking a little more detail about process here because obviously if you're asking for a head nod that we're comfortable moving forward eventually we're going to actually have to commit to this plan yes um so can you speak to um how we foresee this decision going through we're gonna give a head nod tonight and then that begins the collaborative work with cdot but then once we come once it's brought back to the board for an actual decision to um have this exception mm -hmm. to our tip plan is that also going to have the projects listed is that the anticipation uh mr chair director teal no <laughs> um but the process is a couple of things so the first so the first tonight is an indication that we should continue to pursue this and take steps towards bringing a decision item to the board to um, make an exception to that existing waitlist protocol for a one time for this nine million dollars to create this new set aside program and that won't become effective unless the Colorado Transportation Commission also said, agrees that they're going to bring $17 million to the table. So if that doesn't happen, if, if the commission, for whatever reason, says, sorry, we're just not, we're not in a position to be able to sort of commit that $17 million, then the deal's off and this money flows through our waitlist protocol just as it is. But our first step with the board would be to bring back through the TAC and the RTC a policy decision for an exception to the waitlist protocol and create this set aside program so that that would be the next step our proposal would be in the essence of time to take that to TAC at the end of this month and bring that back to rtc and the board at your march meetings so that just creates the set aside program just like all of our other set aside programs then once we know that's in place we'll continue to work with cdot on specifying the criteria the evaluation process the project selection process and we will also bring that back to the board, just like we do with every other set-aside program that you created in the TIP. So before we do a call for projects on any of those set-aside programs, we, be, we bring that criteria and the selection process for approval through TAC and the RTC and the board. So that's the opportunity to sort of focus <laughs> on and weigh in on and approve the specific criteria and selection that we work out with CDOT. Then we do a call for projects as I said, our proposal is that we solicit those projects with the criteria from the subregion. So the subregion, each subregion collaborates in identifying sort of priority applications they submit, and then there's a cooperative, <laughs> there's a cooperative panel that reviews those applications that includes representation from the subregions to actually select the projects to be funded. Do we know if there's an anticipated uh, action by the State Transportation Commission that's going to be? What you proposed we do here, where we get a decision from them within the next month? Short answer. Yeah, short answer, yes. So we teed this concept similar to what we all did with you all tonight with our commission today. And we expect to bring this as a vote for them at their March meeting, which is so fun for me, the same day as the Dr. Cog board meeting <laughs> in March. You get the bonus plan. Yeah. yeah. Great, 20 hour okay. days. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, really Director Seitz, oh, it has to be quick. We're, right. we're losing everyone. I, I will, think they're falling asleep, brief. actually. Um, so um, again, apologize for being new to the conversation. Um, my question is, um, my understanding is you want a head nod. My head's nodding. I like this. I'm enthusiastic like everyone else. When you also, I believe, ask for what possible considerations you'd like to see our criteria, um, I'm hoping that that third bullet point um, would include employment centers, school centers, like the, that safe to school, is that already kind of encapsulated in that bullet point? So we're, yes, okay, yes. thank you. Good short answer, thank you. Any others? If not, we're moving right along. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, committee reports, let's do a fire round. So three sentences or less, stack, Elise Jones. Um, I wasn't there um, and Roger's not here. So if Ron wants to say anything, he can otherwise. Let's move on. Oh, 
which we heard both. Perfect. There you go. All right, moving on. Thank you very much. Uh, Metro Mayor Caucus. What mayor wants to jump up and it, it, I get it on first? There we there go. You go. You Let's see. We talked. We had the uh, uh, presentation by the Bridge House from Aurora and uh, Boulder. We talked about the Flex Fund and funding for homeless activity. Uh, we had a discussion about uh, 1151. And did not come up with a consensus on that. Got it. Talked about some <laughs> other uh, SB 93. And we talked about, uh, had a discussion on the uh, public op option. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Appreciate that very much. Moving right along into the metro area county commissioners, who would like to jump in for that one? Um, we know. had uh, basically a uh, organized uh, get ready for 2020 meeting where we set meeting topics, talked about how to become more effective and whether or not we needed to change anything. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Director Jones. Uh, next up, uh, Jayla Sanchez Warren around the Advisory Committee on Aging. Our meeting's on Friday. Th uh, <laughs> she's the winner. Chicken dinner. <laughs> One sentence. Uh, moving right along, Region Air Quality. Uh, Doug Rex. Thank you, sir. Uh, just a few briefings. We have one on the serious SIP uh, update. Uh, regional Climate Action Planning that we had here at the board a couple months ago and Control Strategy Committee update. That was it. That oh, was pretty close. Uh, next up, E470, George Teal. Actually had two meetings of the E470 board. Um, our soon to be elected uh, chairman uh, got a new role because uh, we did have a, uh, a new vote on uh, leadership of the board. And um, uh, tell you what, I'm gonna keep it brief. So that's the big part. So D <laughs> Director Dyack, are you moving on up like the Jeffersons or something? Uh, I am uh, I'm secretary and uh, Director Partridge is vice chair and Adams County uh, Commissioner Chaz Tedesco is our chair. Oh, congratulations to those. See, I thought I'd spare us those details, but that's fine. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, CDOT, Director White. Other than uh, pushing a lot of snow, you heard about the two big things before CDOT recently, the development of the plan and also this work to address our safety issues. On that note, uh, a compliment to Dr. Cog, we're actually showing the Vision Zero video to our full commission tomorrow as we have uh, this conversation on safety and getting to zero deaths. Really powerful video. Um, so be happy to show that to our entire commission in the morning. And if those that have not seen the video, please use the video, share it on your social media. Some of you are very active. I definitely <laughs> share it. And get your local uh, public TV to you can you can air it there as well. It's worth getting in there. There's only member three or four communities that do Vision Zero. We all do a flavor of it, I believe, but we should encourage our communities to continue to do that. So I didn't mean to tag on. Um, fast tracks, uh, Bill Van Meter. Still not on. Okay, there we go. Beautiful. Before I get fired or leave, I will learn how to do this uh, <laughs> speaker thingy. Okay, so two items. One, Paul Ballard, my new boss and the uh, interim general manager for RTD who our board selected, his first day will be next week. We expect it to be Monday, but you know, who knows with that transition, we do expect him to be here soon though. Um, and then the other item that I have to note is um, the related to the opening of the North Metro line. You may have seen the news that RTD is considering issuing a formal notice of default uh, to the end line design build contractor regional rail partners um, due to the contractors continued delays in meeting project milestones and their inability to fulfill their contractual <laughs> obligations. We've met with the contractor, of course, and they're committed. They in, have informed us to completing the project as soon as possible, but because of these most recent delays, we previous, previously indicated that we expected to open the end line in either May or August. That May date is not achievable at this point. And so that information, along with my new boss coming sometime next week, are my two items. And will your new bosses come and say hello to Dr. Cog next month? 
Uh, I will, um, if, th if you wish yes, that to happen, like to I, will make the I will make the invite known. Yeah, that would be great. Um, moving right along, uh, informational items 17, I'm not going to read it, let's just keep going. Administrative items, next meeting is March 18th. Uh, other, one thing I also want to point out, the March 4th board session of performance engagement has been canceled, so we're not meeting, just so we're clear. And then is there any other matters by members? Yes. Georgetown in the house. Oh, okay. Yes, <laughs> I've seen this. I just wanted to introduce everybody to Parker the Snow Dog. He is the new honorary mayor of Georgetown. <laughs> He's going to assist me in my duties at public events. Um, it's he just got inaugurated last night, so he's new. Come meet him. <laughs> Is that a poster we can leave at Dr. Cog? Um, actually, it belongs to one of my board of selectmen. Oh, so um, I'll see it? if I can get one. Yeah, get a copy. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for that. Everyone drive safe tonight. Be safe. Stay warm. We're adjourned. <laughs>